If you clicked on this video, then you know for a fact that FromSoft makes good games. They make some of the most unique games that I've ever played, and they are without a doubt my favorite game developer. They have a formula that many studios have tried mixing and recreating multiple times, and it usually ends up with a few good ideas, but a lot of missed potential. Lies of P is a Souls-like that manages to blend a fairy tale world into a polished Souls-like experience. The most impressive compliment I can give to this game is that it truly feels like a FromSoft game. Other Souls-likes that are on the market may have a few interesting ideas and themes, but they miss the mark on smooth and fluid gameplay that FromSoft crowns to this very day. Lies of P feels like it takes one of the best aspects from each of FromSoftware's games and morphs it into a new experience that manages to feel fresh and unique. I think that without a doubt. This is the best Souls-like to exist, and parts of this game hold a candle next to FromSoft. If what I just said interests you, then I welcome you to join me. This video will be a commentary on the entirety of Lies of P. I also want to note that I will be talking extensively about Sekiro, so please be aware of spoilers if you have not played that game. My last note before we start this video is that if you want something completely different than what FromSoft has made, this game may be too closely related for your tastes. With that being said, let's start with the game's tutorial. Lies of P's immediate presentation is something that should not be forgotten. As soon as you start a new game, it takes a mere 45 seconds to start controlling the player character. The game skips the other Souls aspects just like Sekiro did. There isn't a variable of classes to choose from, character creator, or a starting gift. This presents some immediate ramifications whether you consciously understand it or not. The game is going to have more of a direct story. You are not playing as an avatar, you are playing as a character in this story. This was the best and obvious choice because there is no reason to have your game world be based around Pinocchio and not have you play as Pinocchio himself. Although Kra is a completely unique setting that's not in the book. At least I couldn't find it in the book. Although, unlike Sekiro, this game starts off strong like Bloodborne and presents you with three weapons that all feel unique and different from each other. One balanced, heavy, and light. This is going to help with replayability since Lies of P's biggest strength is its combat and everything that revolves around it. I'm aware that I just said this game presents you with three different weapons, but in this footage that you're seeing here, I am already equipped with a weapon. In case you didn't know, Liza P and Wolong Fallen Dynasty had a crossover, and this is a unique weapon that was added into the game. But with these three weapon choices, the game flashes an early glimpse of Liza P's weapon system. You won't realize it yet since you're only allowed to pick one weapon, but Liza P's weapon system may be its strongest aspect of the game itself. The weapons in Lies of P have been compared most to Bloodborne because every weapon in this game feels completely unique. I'm going to be sprinkling my thoughts about the weapons throughout this video, but if you are watching this and have not played the game, Lies of P has weapons that are far more unique than Elden Ring and the Souls games. Contrary to what the main narrative is and what I may have suggested, Lies of P feels more like a Sekiro spin-off than a Bloodborne clone. It's easy to see so much Bloodborne in this game since its atmosphere is very jarring, sinister, and has some horror elements with puppets turning evil. But when you look past those elements, it's really taking so many notes from Sekiro. Luckily, I played Sekiro for my last video, and a lot of this was fresh in my mind. I don't want to suggest that this game is a Sekiro clone made by another company, but the beginning of this game feels ripped straight from Sekiro itself. You are awoken, and the game does not hide anything from you. You have clear goals, and it's very hard to be confused with what Lies of P expects out of you. To elucidate upon this, Lies of P's tutorial is very well thought out and explained. For Lies of P's tutorial level, it will present you with frequent pop-ups streamlining the experience for you. Dark Souls and Bloodborne's tutorial allow you to skip and cross over important details. For a game that closely resembles Sekiro, it makes sense that you need all the information about the game since this game is focused on its core mechanics. There are no magic builds, only melee builds with elaborate mechanics. Once the game equips you with knowledge and a weapon, you set foot into the tutorial level. As you open these double doors, the game wants you to take in the atmosphere and environment. The atmosphere in Lies of P is commonly compared to Bloodborne. You start off in a city, fight your way through city landscapes, and the next level is an extension of that city, but in a wealthier section like Bloodborne. I've already compared this game extensively to From Software's games, and it's clear that this game is heavily inspired by FromSoft while they implement their own ideas. I thought I would mention this early within the video because I will bring up FromSoft's games throughout this video. All starting levels in these type of games are interesting case studies, but this is one of the least interesting ones. This is a case where I have to try and interpret developer intentions. The reason I mention developer intentions is because with Souls-like games that are not made by FromSoft, the developers have to hit an interesting sweet spot that is rarely accomplished. Naturally, Souls-like games are obvious to spot, and a portion of their marketing is going to be marketed towards experienced Souls players. Obviously, the developers want to sell as many copies as possible, so they have to make their game look flashy and interesting to get new players involved. Since this game was on Xbox Game Pass at launch and had Pinocchio as part of its marketing, the game was bound to be flooded with less experienced Souls players. 
That is another reason why I mentioned developer intentions. This level is relatively short and on the linear side, although that's probably for the better. I say that this is for the better because if you go into Bloodborne as your very first game of the series, there is no question, you are going to have a hard time. Not only is that level large and complex with multiple paths to expand the level, an optional boss, and the duo werewolves, but it also has multiple enemy NPCs that are attacking you at once, and when you combine all these points, you end up with a level that feels like a late game area with how hard it actually is. The enemy placement and variety hasn't evolved too much yet, and the game is currently teaching new players and experienced players that most enemies don't have a lot of poise, and this upcoming area will remind you that R1 spam will only go so far in this game. My very first playthrough of Liza P, I was still playing it like it was a traditional Souls game, so I wasn't reflecting at all like the game encourages. Luckily that transitions into one of Liza P's many strengths, and it's something that not even Sekiro does. Liza P is a completely viable experience if you mainly rely on dodging and only parry when you absolutely need to. Only a few bosses and enemies in this game are designed so intently on only reflecting. Think of the Mad Clown puppet as an example. The reason I say that Sekiro doesn't have this is because Sekiro solely relies on reflecting for pretty much every attack, and if you get bored of that reflecting style halfway through the game, then you will most likely drop the game regardless of how well designed it actually is. Our tutorial level is close to being done once you beat this enemy with the first Fury attack. By now you should have enough learning time in the game to fight our first boss. Luckily, since we are still in the tutorial, and if you are struggling with the boss itself, there is an NPC right next to the boss Stargazer, so you can experiment with different weapons if the weapon you chose early on isn't something you enjoy. I'm not exactly sure if the devs gave the Parade Master more design time since they knew they were going to reuse this boss at a later point, but that doesn't really matter because the first two bosses in Liza P had to be nailed for a multitude of reasons. You already know the obvious reason it had to be good. It's the first boss of the game and pretty much every player will experience it. Secondly, Lies of P had a demo and as a dev or a publisher, you have to be out of touch with your game's quality or you have to be confident in your product to put out a demo. Lies of P is thankfully the latter and I think that the devs in Round 8 Studio knew they had something special on their hands. The Parade Master signifies one of Lies of P's biggest strengths and it's the bosses in combat. Although not every boss is perfect, and this video will be covering that. The Parade Master follows the same foundation of the level leading up to him, and he won't be hard for experienced players. He is more of a testing boss to nail the game's flow so you can graduate from the tutorial area. He has Red Fury attacks in his first phase, so players can get experience with these attacks reliably since they are present throughout the entire game. Parade Master's first phase is on the simpler side with only 4 or 5 moves. The reason this is most likely the case is because every enemy up to this point had a physical weapon they were using to fight. Enemies later on in this game will continue that trend, and his first phase was most likely a tutor for intuiting a brawly playstyle. His second phase has more physical moves, but he will die pretty quickly by the time you get here because his stagger bar should be close to depleted by now. All of this was most likely calculated by the developers because players are comfortable with blocking and dodging weapon attacks up until this point. Before I end the parade, I guess now is a good time to talk about a completely unique idea that this game brings to the table. If you properly deflect weapon attacks in this game, they will flash a bright red indicator. If you continue parrying enemy attacks, their weapon will break. Bosses also have this weakness built into their weapons, and breaking a boss weapon isn't as exciting as it looks. It's a nice reward for skilled players, and it does make the fight easier. The hitbox reduces so you won't be attacked as often, and more importantly, their damage is reduced. I think breaking boss weapons was a bit of a missed opportunity and could have been expanded upon to reward the player outside of the fight itself. Imagine if Elodora wasn't in this game and the only way to get boss weapons was through altering your playstyle, breaking their weapon and bringing it to Eugenie to fix the weapon. I hope the DLC plays with an idea like this or even the sequel. The Parade Master feels like Sekiro's two earlier bosses put together. You will fight Gyobu who can be deflected and attacked in that game and once you defeat him you will go on to the Blazing Bull who you will rarely deflect. Sekiro took how you will interact with its combat and split it into two fights, one with deflecting and one without. Liza P just stuffed it into one fight but had the primary training session in the first phase. For another example, if we take Ludix Gundir from Dark Souls 3, veterans will slaughter him and new players can experiment on him. Liza P just designed a longer tutorial level to give players time to grasp these variations of mechanics so they had the ability to properly execute them on level enemies and a boss. After the Parade Master, you are showed pretty quickly to Hotel Krat and you are introduced to your first interaction with Lying. Now is as good of a time as ever to mention how Lying works in this game, and I'm surprised I have not heard too many people call out how it's somewhat underutilized and inconsequential, especially for that being Pinocchio's main shtick. The only real substance this game has with Lying is getting the Golden Lie weapon. Rather than that, it's just a few side quests and endings that Lying affects. This is also a lesser known feature, but the more you lie, your nose actually grows when you look at it in a shadow. 
I'm sure that there are a few people that didn't know about that, and I think it's a really cool on-the-nose nod to the audience. As I said, lying is inconsequential, and lying to get into Hotel Kra is like a telltale game. Your decision doesn't matter, and no matter what happens, you have to lie to proceed and access the hotel. If you said that you are a puppet, the game will forbid you from entering and you have to give the game the answer it needs. This may have immediately made a few Pinocchio fans upset right off the bat, since it may have an early glimpse on lying not affecting much of anything. I won't say too much about this as I am indifferent on lying consequences, but it could have been a really cool segue into the game having a hard mode if you intentionally refuse to lie. Regardless, this is what I would mark as the end of the tutorial. Afterwards, the game puts you in Hotel Kra and it's a basic hub area that you are going to be immediately familiar with. There's nothing particularly groundbreaking about this sub, so I won't be mentioning much about it. Once you've explored Hotel Kra, you are supposed to go to Elysian Boulevard, which is right outside the hotel. Elysian Boulevard is Liza P's first real level. This game is now in full effect, and it should trust that you understand the game's mechanics. The reason I say it should trust instead of the game does trust you is because Elysian Boulevard feels like an extended tutorial level. Very little actually changes here and the scale wasn't tipped radically enough. Admittedly, part of this does make sense within the world. This area is in a wealthier section of the city, so it's understandable that there wasn't a drastic change in mood and atmosphere. Bloodborne actually follows this exact same layout, and I actually praise Bloodborne while I have to criticize Liza P. Before I speak about Bloodborne, I need to say what I dislike about Liza P first, so we can see how Bloodborne did this better. This level can be summed up with a lack of variety. There simply is not enough of a leap for this level to be that memorable. Visually, it's still dark and the surrounding clutter of the level doesn't look that different from the tutorial level. What confuses me the most is that most of the enemies that you are fighting here are the same enemies from the tutorial level. It's even more interesting because the enemy variety is a huge win for this game. It's almost like that the developers thought the tutorial was too short and they treated this as an extended tutorial. If this isn't the case, then I still wouldn't call it a success since there's nothing else to teach the player besides adding NPC quests. After all of that has been said, I have to treat this level as an extended tutorial since the level design doesn't drastically change either. Since Bloodborne has the same layout of evolving to another part of the city, I have to say Bloodborne's initial two levels are on a completely different level than Liza P. Bloodborne's visuals change a lot more and the enemy encounters vary too. The first level of Bloodborne has a larger mob density, but they're all weaker individual enemies, so your goal is to not get ganged up on. The second level in Bloodborne will introduce enemies that are stronger while still having superior level design. And this is where Liza P's biggest weakness rises. If you only judge the level design by its physical space, Liza P's levels are fairly linear and will get uninteresting if you care about exploring large and vast levels such as Central Yarnum or Stormvale Castle. Liza P does a pretty good job at shining the levels with interesting enemy variety and atmosphere, but the levels can be summed up with a polished exterior and a lackluster core. There are few divergent paths in this game, and they don't have much exploration besides the linear, narrow path you're supposed to go down. Interestingly, Dark Souls 3 had the same criticism, but I would say that Dark Souls 3's levels are far more interesting to explore than Liza P's levels. Some people don't care about level physical space as much, and they're okay with more combat-focused and linear levels. I think Liza P's launch difficulty bosses, oddly enough, represent the levels in an opposite way. The launch of Liza P wasn't problematic with performance issues or bugs, but rather the difficulty of the game itself. Bosses were very tanky, you didn't have the Rising Dodge P organ ability, and they even had Polandina sell more quartz that you can use. People who play these games are usually okay with hard bosses, after all that's what the series is known for. But Lies of P's launch bosses were a wall that would take hours and hours to carve through. This is going to link back to the levels of this game because you knew that once you got to a boss on the launch patch, you were going to be there for a while. There was no variety besides gruesomely challenging, and the game's levels follow the same formula of overly linear. My last note on the level design right now is Sekiro was able to get away with less exploration in their levels because of having stealth combat, extended mobility options, and sword clashing at the same time. Liza P does not have any of these quirks, which will make the levels feel very samey around the time you hit the mid-game. I also understand that some people don't care about the level design conversation, so I will make a few parting comments once we get to the next level and I will keep those thoughts tucked away since my opinion does not change for the rest of the game. Now that that's over, once you hit the midpoint of this level you will meet an extremely important early game vendor that sells an item to streamline the difficulty if you choose to do so. This vendor sells the electric coil stick which handles puppets with ease. 
Besides the initial starting weapons, this is the first new weapon that you can obtain, and with how distinctive it looks, I assume most players bought it just to try something new. Since we are still early within the game, they wouldn't lose many valuable materials. Shortly after you interact with that vendor, you are going to come across a weeping woman that's going to ask for a favor. This is one of the two NPC quest lines in this level. I won't be covering every single NPC quest line, but I do want to comment on a few later in the video. NPC quest lines in this game have been streamlined and easier to understand. I didn't find too many of these quest lines to be that interesting, but I do prefer the no-nonsense system that's in this game. The game tells you when you can progress the quest, and it's never a wild goose chase. Shortly after you talk with the Weeping Woman, you are going to encounter your first human boss fight. The biggest issue with these fights is that most of them can be backstab abused, eerily similar to an issue that plagued Dark Souls 1. It's not as obvious and as simple as Dark Souls 1, you will have to interact with these fights somewhat. Luckily, there are only three NPC fights you have to interact with. The rest can be ignored. After the Mad Donkey fight, you meet Geppetto and he gives you a key to unlock the door straight ahead of you. This will unlock Cross City Hall. As soon as you activate the Stargazer here, Gemini will sadly start speaking and he will remind you about the weapon assembly tool. This piece of advice was accurately placed because it's going to make players think carefully about weapons in general. Our next fight is a DPS check after all. Krat City Hall is a pretty short area, it's more so a boss stargazer checkpoint than anything else. This also marks the end of Elysian Boulevard, and it has to be labeled as a bit of a disappointment. It especially hurts because this is one of the first levels of the game, and the first levels are usually some of the strongest. This level needs support in every area, enemy variety, and visual variety. Luckily, our next level is a bit of a step up, so we can look forward to that. The notion that good, good bosses entail should not be underestimated. They have a lot riding on their shoulders, and if these types of bosses do not succeed in every single facet, it will result in a failure of boss design. Think of how well Genichiro taught you how to play Sekiro, or how well the duo Bell Gargoyles taught you to fight multiple enemies in Dark Souls, or even how Margaret taught you that it's okay to accept defeat and you can always return later. From Software is very good at encapsulating every mechanic into one boss that will ultimately represent the whole game. Lies of P arguably doesn't have a good, good boss. I would also say that Dark Souls 3 does not have a good, good boss. The spike in difficulty in this game doesn't reach what From Software usually does. This is by no means a bad thing, but I definitely prefer when it does happen because of the elated memories you have when you did eventually beat Kanichiro. I mention all of this because the Scrapped Watchman is a DPS check on your weapon, but I'm not exactly sure if he is the get good boss that forces all of Liza P's mechanics in one fight. I want you to pay close attention to the footage that I'm showing you. This is actually demo footage I ended up keeping, and as you can see, I am not engaging with Liza P like the game wants. I didn't do any blocking or perfect reflecting here. Admittedly, since I was playing a Souls-like, my brain was wired like it is for when I play Dark Souls or Elden Ring. But if you played a Souls game first and then you played Sekiro, Genichiro simply will not tolerate that. He will knock the Souls out of you and force you to play how Sekiro demands. And this boss, in my opinion, simply does not do that. I remember on my very first playthrough of Lies of P, I didn't really start to parry like the game wants you to until the Black Rabbit Brotherhood fight. The spinning move in that fight is going to be miserable if you don't play Lies of P like Lies of P wants you to play. So, after saying all of that, I don't think I'll be considering the Scrapped Watchman the get good boss of this game. I know for a fact that it's not Fuoco, so I think we can say Lies of P has a very linear difficulty spike for the most part. He's a well-designed boss, and he's a definite step up from the Parade Master in terms of difficulty and moveset complexity. Once you beat this boss, you are rewarded with the ability to use the P-Organ system, which gives us a good transition to talk about that. I first need to state that the P-Organ system has grown on me immensely since my first playthrough. I was mostly negative about this system early on because it was somewhat plundered when the game launched. Systems like Sekiro's Upgrade Paths and Liza P's P-Organ are very delicate systems because both of these games have had oversights. In case you were unsure of how Sekiro blundered, the Mikuri counter in Sekiro is not a move that Wolf has in his base moveset. It's something you need to unlock with XP. I'm not exactly sure why FromSoft didn't think this move should be a part of the base moveset. The only thing I was able to think of is they didn't want to overwhelm the player with mechanics. You can deflect thrust attacks in Sekiro, so maybe that was their logic. Liza P had an oversight with the P-Organ system, but luckily the developers were open-minded to listening to players. Rising Dodge was initially not a part of P's base moveset. If you were not playing Liza P at launch, the worst offender for this was the puppet Shovel Guy. This clip should hopefully alleviate any lingering questions. Locking basic mechanics on the player's side is always going to be a gray area. Besides the Makiri counter, Sekiro accomplishes this by making player side mechanics more quality of life in that game. Upgrades like running and then being able to slide into cover or mid-air combat arts are good examples of these being niche add-ons that aren't completely necessary to gameplay. 
Liza P resolved that by giving Rising Dodge in the player's moveset, but the Link Dodge ability is still locked behind the P-Organ system. It's on the first tier, so players will be able to get it quickly, but it doesn't feel that great when I would use it. I almost don't even notice it being there. Ultimately, core moves that are going to be used all the time, including Link Dodge, should probably be avoided for all future games with this system. The P-Organ is also expanded when you choose your core upgrade ability. You are sent to a separate tab that allows you to choose a more minor buff, more immunity to certain debuffs, an extra healing charge, or you can take less damage when you are out of healing. Besides the ones that give you more healing, these are relatively minor buffs and you can play the game and barely notice them. Once you enter New Game Plus 2, the P-Organ becomes potentially problematic for a certain set of players. There is one ability in particular that arguably breaks the intended experience for this game. You have the ability to block the Red Fury attacks that essentially every enemy has. This is unique because the game is allowing itself to sit back and open up for more fun. But I think I should mention this for people who have that ability but have not played Lies of P for some time now. If you plan on doing a future playthrough or the DLC on your current character, I would suggest respecting so you get the intended experience. You can play the game however you like, I always try and go for the intended experience personally. Lies of Peace Pjorgen suits the game completely fine and it even works with the story, but Sekiro offers far more interesting upgrades. There are multiple combat arts that can be purchased in that game that can alter your gameplay more than what Lies of P's upgrades offer. I didn't use many of these combat arts in Sekiro, but FromSoft did put a lot of animation work into them, so that's why they went out for me personally. Since these games are more focused with melee combat only, they can work in future games, but the system definitely has not been perfected yet. Each of these games have made questionable decisions to say the least with their upgrade paths, and that can lead to some players thinking that these systems should be dropped and never seen again. Most of what Liza P offers in the P-Organ system could have been achieved on the gameplay side of things in general. They don't drastically change how the game plays outside of the Link Dodge and the very final P-Organ upgrade that we spoke about. This reason alone is why I am mostly indifferent about it. Liza P's levels are on the linear side, Side, so not finding these courts shouldn't be that much of an issue. With Sekiro, once you beat the game one single time, you are probably close to being a parry god. Most of the unique combat arts get in the way since you can parry your whole way through that game. I hope to see a game that perfects this system without any blunders, although I kind of doubt that will happen. In order to progress through the game after the scrapped Watchmen, you have to get a key from Geppetto which will unlock a door to the Workshop Union entrance. Most players will do a few tasks in the hotel and go back to upgrade their weapon. Eugenie will give you the Fulminous Arm, which will be extremely useful since the upcoming level is solely puppets except for one terrible NPC fight. The area leading up to the workshop is a well-hidden bridge to smooth out the transition from going to a city to a factory. Even though this area isn't part of the meat, it still has a crucial side quest that is definitely worth speaking about. Periodically throughout the game you will hear a phone ring, and once you answer the phone, the King of Riddles is on the other line. The person who voice acted him definitely deserves some praise because I would say he's one of the best written and acted characters in this game. That's honestly saying a lot since Geppetto himself is Margaret from Elden Ring. Nevertheless, the riddles he presents to you are quite easy and I think the devs knew he was such an interesting character, so he should be an NPC that all players should have the opportunity to interact with. If you do happen to answer incorrectly, you have a chance to write one wrong and you can get an apple later on in the game to get the trinity key that you missed. Funnily enough, he is also a bit of a troll and he will give you boxes that will damage or outright kill you for answering incorrectly. Although most of his riddles can be narrowed down by common sense and at worst, you have a 50-50 shot to guess correctly if you are unsure of the answer. This is where I must admit that I got one wrong on my first playthrough and gave the apple to another NPC, so I didn't complete his quest until my newest playthroughs for this video. Once you correctly answer his question, you will receive a trinity key that can be unlocked later in this level. After you get done talking with Arlequino, you progress forward to this level's main stargazer. This little section of the level has a few things I would like to expand upon. I need to go back to the idea of developer intentions, and that is because of a note right next to this level's stargazer. It's essentially the devs winking at you. They are reminding you that puppets are weak to electricity. The intentions of the developers are quite clear when you look at it through this lens. They are telling you to use electricity, but this little note is either me overthinking something or understanding the devs quite clearly. In the section on Elysium Boulevard, I spoke about how that level felt like an extended tutorial. Not enough changed in that level, and the reasoning behind that may have been for new players that aren't as skilled as experienced Souls players. And now that the game has given you the Fulminous Arm, this note and the opportunity to buy an electric weapon, the devs wanted levels that were more streamlined and the main challenge of the game will come later. I'm not exactly sure if they were afraid players would get stuck, but I find this level to be just as easy as the previous level. The stargazers are also extremely generous here. The game looks like it gives you two paths to choose from at the start of this level. My first playthrough I was hit with the joy of excitement because I thought the game was expanding upon its level design. But if you choose to go left, you are hit with a brick wall that is an optional boss. 
You can brute force this boss, but you're not supposed to. You are meant to come back once you've drained the poison that surrounds his arena. Once you eventually backtrack, you can go into an optional room and get a butter knife that's on fire. This weapon is actually kind of fun to use at times, but I really hope that players didn't fall into the mindset of, I will have an electricity weapon and I will use this dagger when I need fire. If they enjoy doing that, then that's perfectly fine, but I think Liza P's weapons are so impeccable that you are missing out on some of the funnest content in this game by using two basic weapons. Once you start progressing through the intended path, you will end up in the assembly line of this workshop. There's not a whole lot to say here, but there is a chest with an upgrade cartridge for you to equip. Liza P has three defensive options that don't do much besides adjust stat numbers. They're not all that interesting, but it does keep power progression flowing. Our next part is going to introduce a new mini boss that holds shields, so attacking him head on isn't that easy. I think this fight is pretty good, and for the most part, Liza P's enemy design and boss design is spot on, so don't expect too many complaints with the combat side of things. After this mini boss, you are greeted with a Stargazer. I am sorry that I keep pampering on about the level design, but I wish there was more of a combat challenge leading up to the Stargazer. You can see in this clip that I still have three healing charges, so there wasn't much of a battle leading up here. FromSoft's games do a really good job at splitting bonfires apart, making it so when you do reach a bonfire, you have an elated feeling because you fought through multiple mobs of enemies and earned that right to progress the level. Liza P simply feels like it's going through the motions. Just to prove my point, you are only forced to interact with a mere seven enemies going from the starting Stargazer to this one. I will try and refrain from digging too deeply into the level design from here on out because my complaints stay the same for a while. It's too linear and lacks exploration. Once you get to the mid-level Stargazer, the game opens up a new exploration route that doesn't lead to much besides a few items. While this section of this level isn't as interesting in terms of combat, I do have to say though that keen players may have noticed this area right after talking with Arlequino. When you move through the intended route, the game expands upon level hazards with a ball of fire. You have to weave in between pockets of the level while advancing through this narrow hallway. On the bright side, dealing with this hazard and fighting enemies at the same time does assist with level variety and nuances. You are forced to juggle multiple challenges at once. I wish the ball was more interactive or even opened up a hidden area similar to Sense Fortress in Dark Souls 1. But I did say that I wouldn't go on about the level design and I plan to keep my word on that. After you push through this hallway, the level does get a lot more interesting here. My favorite part of this is how the level creatively links you back to the first Stargazer that's not something as basic as a locked door right next to the Stargazer itself. You actually put down a pipe that you walk across. It's placed really well, and it's rare for unique link backs like this to show up in the game. You can also do a fight against an optional NPC. I will only be speaking about mandatory NPC fights for the rest of this video. I only mention this fight versus the survivor because on my second playthrough, he corner trapped me for a portion of the fight. These fights seem to have unlimited stamina and they're exactly like the hunter fights in Bloodborne. They're unbalanced. To be fair, the Bloodborne fights are far more frustrating and harder, so these aren't offensive in any manner, but massively forgettable. Once you've explored any side areas to this level, the next path forward is going to be the last area of this level and will be the first encounter with Benini. Similar to Cross City Hall, this area is nothing more than a stargazer placement for the boss runback. Preceptive players may find a deserter's note that is heavily alluding to the King of Puppets and Fuoco, the boss of this arena. This area is relatively short and the game has gone on for a couple of hours by this point, so the devs may have wanted to keep this section short, so player perception doesn't view this game as only killing frenzied puppets. I like the idea of a puppet factory and I would have liked to see more mini bosses in this area. This level certainly isn't the greatest, but I do find it more enjoyable than the previous one. Liza P's level design gets somewhat better towards the mid game, so hopefully I stay true to my word and I don't turn this video into a level design rant. The nicest thing I can say about Fuoco is that there isn't another boss like him. I can think of multiple bosses in this game that give me vibes that I have felt from from software bosses, but Fuoco stands unique. This may sound like I am hyping the boss up to be impressive, but I find him to be quite forgettable. Being entirely forgettable may be more of an insult than being a bad boss. We all remember the beta chaos for the multitude of reasons that he is awful, just as we all remember Gale for the reasons he is great. Fuoco is in this rare middle ground that I simply can't mention anything that makes him memorable. When I was writing this script, I thought his artistic design stood out to me, but he still has the humanoid features. He stands on two legs and fights with two arms. Fuoco's design is one of Lies of P's boss flaws. The good fights are extremely obvious and the bad fights are nothing. Think of how you at least remember the jump scare with Wolnir in Dark Souls 3, or fighting your way up to one-shot the Ancient Wyvern. FromSoft tries to smooth out their less interesting bosses, and this is something that Lies of P did not attempt. So, to some up Fuoco, he's a forgettable boss. Luckily, our next boss is exceptionally good. Now that we're done with Fuoco, the game is starting to graduate from puppets as the main source of enemies. Our welcome break isn't quite over yet since these puppets are most likely escaped puppets from the factory. The game is slowly easing them out for the carcasses to be our next enemy source for a stretch of gameplay. The area leading up to the cathedral library is a welcome change of aesthetic. 
Up to this point, it was more steampunk inspired themes, and this section evolves past that. It may not look like a pretty evolution right now since it's just wooden planks, but it's another bridge to mask the transition phase that we are currently in. Since we are in another transition phase, adding in a mini boss to this area would have added some spice to the gameplay side. I know I have stated in this video, but Lies of P's enemy variety is incredibly strong, but times like this within the game would suggest otherwise. Since this area is further away from the puppet factory, it would make sense that different puppet types traveled further than others. Now that the transition has been made, the new enemy source are carcasses. Similar to how the game gave you an electric weapon to deal with puppets, you also had the opportunity to get the fire butter knife to make this level easier. I assume the developers did this since the game does not want players struggling as much with levels, although the upcoming area will introduce Alidoro, the boss soul vendor for this game. His weapons are so unique that most players will probably use a unique weapon once they interact with him. These new enemies are welcome and they are more than a visual change as well. They attack more frantically and behave like a fast zombie. These two sides of the coin do a good job at smoothing out Lies of P's design. Puppets usually have slower startup moves, and carcasses are more frantic in their design. Once you defeat a small horde of carcasses, you are introduced to an alchemist named Gianjo, who has the petrification disease. More importantly, this NPC will give you the cube that is a confusing missed opportunity. This item can give you a multitude of buffs, but you can only use it once until you upgrade the path in the P organ system. Since quartz are such a valuable resource, it's a waste of precious and vital material. The buffs that you can receive are noticeable, but the cube feels too awkward and clunky to use for my tastes. The only time I foresee the cube being useful is for NPC summons during bosses. The cube is definitely worth using for those instances. I hope the DLC will alter this and give the cube passive buffs that are active as long as it's in your inventory. I guess it doesn't really matter all that much, and I can foresee them letting it be. Regardless, this item is clunky and awkward. I doubt many players used it more than a few times unless it chose to summon phantoms for help. Once you are done talking with Gianjo, the game presents you with a beautiful shot of the cathedral itself. On your first playthrough, you will definitely be excited to go inside and see what it offers. The narrow path to proceed is a welcome change of combat pace. The game plays with having multiple enemies attack you in a rapid succession, and the lead up to this area only had one or two enemies attacking you at most. Once you open the doors to the chapel itself, the mood matches the grand scale of what you were just presented with. Sadly, this area is another missed opportunity just like the cube. Right now this area looks great, but this area simply isn't as complex or as interesting like it looks from the outside. Think of the first time you saw the cathedral in the Ring City DLC for Dark Souls 3. Now that you can see them side by side, I even think Liza P's looks somewhat cooler, and Dark Souls 3 had the same letdown this game does. It wasn't taken full advantage of. It's more justifiable for Dark Souls 3 since that DLC was already huge as it is, but Liza P's Cathedral looks far larger and vast. When I see this, I still kind of get Anne Orlando vibes, and I remember thinking this was going to be extremely complex once I got inside. I wish this was the game's one big expansive level with a maze-like structure on the inside to put my complaints to ease. Although, I did say earlier that I would refrain from going on for too long about the level design. So, let's talk about this area. Liza P does a pretty good job at foreshadowing its bosses. Whether you read about an upcoming boss in lore notes, the area alludes to their presence, or in this case, you are shown a sneak peek at what to expect. The first section of this level focuses more on being vertically inclined and using the level design as a hazard alongside the enemies. Some people will definitely find this annoying since it's easy to fall down or waste some of your healing charges, but I find this to be a nice change of pace from the usual fight encounters that this game relies on. Once you work past these enemies, the game brings back the ball obstacle as an idea and it hasn't evolved past its first iteration. If anything, the ball is notably worse since I am almost certain that you are forced to take damage from this ball no matter what. If this is a simple joke from the devs, then I will play along. But this isn't even a joke you can laugh at like mimic chests in Dark Souls. The rotating gears that you have been platforming on actually did evolve with the level. This one you are seeing here has a really well hidden weapon that I assume most players will miss on their first playthrough. This area actually has a cryptic vessel that is completely unique to Lies of P. I won't talk about them extensively since they are relatively simple, but I do recommend doing them on your first playthrough. Most of them do reward quartz and cool outfits. Once you are done riding the ferris wheels, you go down an elevator and are introduced to the last section of this level before the boss. This final part is an extension of the decay mechanic that was seen earlier. Blobs of goo are stuck to the ceilings, and if you're not careful they will drop on you and cause damage plus decay buildup. Not to mention there is a returning enemy throwing decay blobs at you. This same principle is repeated for the rest of the level, and your goal is to push the fire down so that it will dissolve the substance below. Once the decay has been removed, you can unlock the gate to the boss room. 
I had mentioned that this level has our boss vendor here and he essentially unlocks some of the best of this game. Once you go up this elevator, you come face to face with Aladoro, or the person you think is Aladoro at least. He has a story that I'll comment on at a later point. Once you speak to him, he'll ask a question that allows you to lie. I remember on my first playthrough I was so unsure of what to do. I remember Bloodborne also has a safe hub where you can send NPCs, and you could even send an enemy that turns into a werewolf that will consequently slaughter everyone. I ended up sending him to the hotel on my first playthrough, but this is another lie that is like a telltale game. Your choice will not matter. Regardless of what you do, Aladora will end up in Hotel Krat whether you like it or not. Sending him elsewhere does not kill him, and once you do meet up with him, he will tell you that he's upset and he ultimately goes to Hotel Krat. The devs definitely made a right decision on keeping him safe, since having the boss and PC die for a decision that was a 50-50 would have been very frustrating. The weapons he sells and the weapons in Liza P are highlights of this game. They are universally loved. After we talk about the boss of this level, I will go in-depth on weapons in this game. For now, Aladoro marks the end of this level and this one gets a meh from me. The carcasses are a nice change of pace, but ultimately the physical space was not that interesting to me. After Archbishop Andreas, we are in the mid-game and the next sections are well done. I find that I am in the vast minority with Andreas. Whenever I see discussion about him online, it's mostly in a negative light. At first, I didn't like him either. He was one of the hardest bosses at launch before they made the game easier. He was a stone wall that was gruesome to climb over. Coming back to my new playthroughs, he has risen to a solid A tier if I were to rank every boss in this game. He has a lot of everything that flows seamlessly in his kit. His first phase is going to be a gluttonous monster and his second phase combines two play styles together. A monster that uses his body as a weapon, and the one-winged angel that uses a physical staff for his weapon. What this boss excels at is allowing the dodge and the reflect to shine equally in one fight. Most Liza P bosses have a few nuances in their fights, where unless you're 100% certain that you can properly deflect a multitude of attacks, it's probably better to dodge out of the way. With Andreas, it's occasionally better to dodge towards him so you can get free attacks in. You can watch out for this when he lifts his arm for a slam attack. The most impressive part of this fight is actually how the camera functions. Periodically throughout the fight, he will adjust his body so you have to rewire your brain to a new moveset. When this is actually happening, the camera will adjust to the new side that you are attacking. This could have been a potential dire oversight by the devs if they didn't adjust the camera for you. Camera issues have burdened these types of games for a while, and you can't ever not have an issue with the camera in these types of games. Think of it like hitbox issues. You will have a bad hitbox. It's just how rare are they? Since the game usually adjusts the camera well enough for the player, it's something to note because it's extremely important for removing frustration for new players. I feel like FromSoft's games and every other Souls-like that I have played have never taught players how to properly use their camera. It's usually why new players have such a hard time with duo bosses. Not only because they usually are harder, but because if your camera is locked to one of the two enemies, you won't have the right perspective for the other enemy. Andreas is one of the better fights in this game, and I hope his placement doesn't ruin it for most players. If he is generally disliked by the community, then this game provides back-to-back -back bad bosses since the Black Rabbit Brotherhood is our next major fight. I also want to note that I have no musical talent, but I think besides the Trinity Sanctum OST, this one is the best. Now that we are done with Andreas, I would safely say that we are in Lysa P's mid-game. This is probably the strongest phase of this game. I mentioned that after we beat Andreas, we would talk about weapons since the boss vendor is available, and I must say that the weapons in Lysa P are special. I think that they even surpass from software's other games, including Bloodborne. I have sat on my desk, looking at a blank page, trying to type a well-crafted description of this game's weapons. I simply do not think I can do it justice without showing and telling. It's rare to analyze something and say, it's perfect, but Liza P's weapons encapsulate that idea for me. I have zero criticisms about the weapons in this game. I am showing a few weapons on the screen right now, and I really do want to read the comment section about fun combinations that you guys use. The obvious comparison with Liza P's weapons is Bloodborne. These two are essentially neck and neck in terms of quality with their weapons. There is one crucial factor that will decide if you prefer Liza P's weapon system or Bloodborne's. Bloodborne has a total of 26 weapons, including the DLC weapons that were added. It's easy to argue that each of Bloodborne's weapons is essentially two weapons in one. The trick variation alters what the weapon is capable of quite drastically. And since each weapon that is in Bloodborne is essentially two weapons in one, that means that Bloodborne's weapons require more skill and have a higher skill ceiling for players to master. 
Not only should you have the knowledge of when to use the trick variation and when to use the standard variation, the game also has extra bits of micro knowledge since you can slash at enemies and do the trick variation at the same time. You have the ability to weave extra hits in on enemies and bosses if you have the skill to do so. Some weapons in Bloodborne also have an L2 attack variation. This is usually with strength weapons such as Ludwig's Holy Blade. In this clip here, I am pressing L2 and it has new attack animations. So the trick variation of strength weapons really has more depth than Liza P's weapons. I also can't forget to mention that Bloodborne has your gun to parry enemies. I think after saying all of that, you can't deny that Bloodborne's weapons take more skill. But I also won't lie to you, using the L2 on heavy weapons and switching trick weapons within hits is a nuance that very few players will actually use. I've played a lot of Bloodborne, probably more than most, and I can safely say that I was never stuck at a boss and I was so desperate that I started to practice these niche weapon moves. With Liza P's weapons, they are just as unique with how different each of them are from each other, and they have flashy abilities built into the weapon. Some of these abilities aren't simple long combos for big damage, but they incorporate skill into them too. The Wolong Fallen Dynasty weapon is a great example of this. If you dodge towards an enemy and use a Fable slot, you can actually counter their hit with a hit of your own, and if you do it successfully, your attack will be empowered. This one weapon is probably more skillful than other aspects of Bloodborne because parrying in Bloodborne is far easier and safer since your gun is ranged. Now, I think all of what I just said is fair, but I have left out one crucial weapon, and it's the Two Dragons Sword. This weapon is the epitome of skill. It manages to make Liza P's combat even more skillful since you can do damage and reflect attacks at the same time. I would like to say that I'm better than average at these games, but this weapon is simply above my skill. It's a very respectable weapon, and the devs really went out of their way with this weapon to make it as flashy as possible. Everything about it exemplifies style and substance. If you are a perfect Liza P player, this weapon is the best weapon in the game. The weapons that I'm currently talking about are only the boss weapons. Liza P has 29 normal weapons that can be altered drastically. The weapons can be torn apart and you can slot different blades on different handles and vice versa. With 29 normal weapons, that means there is a total of 841 total combinations. Bloodborne's individual quality of weapons may be ever so slightly better than Lies of P, and it's very minimal. So much so that it's barely worth mentioning, in my opinion. But Lies of P wins out because you can really never run out of ideas. Since Bloodborne only has 26 total weapons, you will eventually narrow them down to your liking, only leaving you with a dozen or so. The same logic can be applied to Lies of P, but I think the variation count is far, far higher. This is without the DLC weapons too. If you happen to be watching this when the DLC is out, I assume that it was great, and I assume they added more unique weapons. I think this section may be the most important section of the video, and I hope I did it justice. While Bloodborne's may be more skill-oriented, I can't lie, Lies of P has the flashy aspect that most players will cling on to. The animation work that went into these is very appealing. I ultimately prefer Lies of P's weapons and combat over Bloodborne. Before we move on from the weapons, I am going to take a quote from Joseph Anderson. In his Elden Ring video, he said, Elden Ring is so good it made me like poisonous swamps again, and I'm going to flip that and say, Lies of P's weapons are so good it made my troglodyte self not use a greatsword. I didn't know when to incorporate Legion Arms into this video, so hey, let's do it here. Legion Arms are uninteresting. I won't go into too much detail about them because there really isn't that much to talk about. I think that if they had to refine something the least in this game, the correct answer was going to be the Legion Arms. It's like the guns in Bloodborne. They're not the meat of the combat. This game had three years of development time, so they probably had to judge if it's worth investing more time into Legion Arms. At the very least, they function properly and they don't need them to do anything else since they've met the bare minimum. The second thing to mention is that if you look at Sekiro, a game made by a far more renowned studio that likely had a higher budget, the Shinobi prosthetic tools are far more interesting than Lies of P's but weren't all that used. From Software put a lot of time into these arms and the main ones you will see in that game are the Shurikens, Umbrella, and Firecrackers. The others that I have failed to list are niche and quite useless outside of a few enemies or bosses where their niche excels. This is a completely acceptable design philosophy and I respect it, but ultimately, reflecting is the very core of Sekiro and the amount of time and money they would have had to put into Legion Arms probably wouldn't have been worth it. I find them to be more of a chore to use than anything. The only ones that don't feel like a chore are the gun and the shield. By no means are these Legion Arms even comparable in terms of quality to Sekiro's prosthetic tools, and I don't think many people cared. I would like to see at least one Legion arm reach the quality of Sekiro's arms in the DLC, but I really don't use these arms that much so they're not my main focus. 
They could even play with a more magic-based arm to get early feedback with a magic system for the game's sequel. It's also annoying that until you go into new game plus runs, you cannot have more than one Legion arm equipped. Sekiro lets you have three equipped at all times, and while they do break immersion at times since Wolf will randomly grow a long axe out of its hand, they encourage you to use them more since Sekiro's arms are cooler. I also want to point out that the presentation of these arms are really quite good, and you need to go into a certain menu to see the amount of detail that went into these arms. I do think most of these arms are underbaked, but even if they were baked, I wouldn't use them that often. Just like how I don't use Sekiro's that often either. Now that we're out of the cathedral, the game's aesthetic is transitioning back to a forest-like biome. If you remember leaving Vanini's factory, the game had a transition level that was a forest biome just like this. Lies of Peace certainly isn't an ugly game, but the game also never hits the strives of beauty that FromSoft's games achieve. Even a game like Bloodborne doesn't have, per se, breathtaking sights like Fountainhead Palace and Sekiro, but the quote-unquote ugly bits of the game are more moody and atmospheric than what Lies of Peace usually achieves. Art is completely subjective and that's why I will try and refrain from talking about it too much. I just thought that this level would be a good example since the level right before Vadini's factory looks similar. Leading up to this level you will find an inactive golden stargazer right next to our main stargazer for this level. This is most likely going to be our key to accessing the DLC. If this stargazer isn't related to the DLC in any way, then this is going to be a completely inactive asset like the Bloodborne door after defeating Cleric Beast. Going forward, you will fight your way to a broken down village and find a wanted poster for the Black Rabbit Brotherhood. I will have a lot to say about their fight, but this group of stalkers all have really well made outfits and aesthetic. In case any of you are curious, in the original Pinocchio book there were four Black Rabbits that actually carried a coffin for Pinocchio. They were not humans, but literal rabbits. The devs took that page and morphed this idea into something completely new. I am sure that nearly every aspect of this game is a mild reference from a few of Pinocchio's stories, and they clashed them into one. Since we found that wanted poster, the game is slowly easing us back into Black Rabbit Brotherhood territory. The game alluded to them earlier when we first entered Elysium Boulevard. They're definitely the main villain until Simon Manus comes into play. Since this level continues with Liza P's linear fashion, there isn't much to say in terms of the complexity that it presents. The more interesting part about this area and level is that this is close to the game's peak difficulty. The mid-game for these types of games is usually the point where you have conquered all the skills that the game forces you to have, and now the devs will test those skills in different ways. The reason I mention this is because if you can beat the Black Rabbit Brotherhood boss fight, then you can beat the rest of the game without too many roadblocks. FromSoft's other games have this exact same layout. If you can beat Genichiro, you have the skills to beat Ishin. If you can beat Ornan Smo, then you've reached the peak of the game's difficulty. Your skills are usually there, they're just not refined enough. They need to be sharpened a little bit more. But those foundations of the skills are planted in your brain, and those core foundations are what the bosses will utilize. They don't pull anything new that you have not seen before. Optional bosses usually break this rule like Millennia or Demon of Hatred. These bosses are always tucked away in an obtuse area for players to discover. Since Liza P only has one optional area, they put their final challenging boss at the very end of the game, and it's completely optional. Although I am probably in the minority here, and I struggle with Romeo and the Black Rabbit Brotherhood the most. The Nameless Puppet is a hard fight, but I wouldn't say he's the super hard last hurrah fight to the game. Both Sekiro and Liza P hit a pretty good balance for their difficulty, and I hope the sequel that Liza P gets expands that idea of one final area, one final push of difficulty. Now that we've reached this level's Stargazer, we are greeted with the two stalkers that we met at Vanini's factory. These characters will show up more frequently now since we're close to accessing the gold coin fruit. Their story is a seamless way to interact with story and gameplay simultaneously. They will offer a team up and will fight alongside you if you accept their invitation. They're not supposed to be here after all. The Black Rabbit Brotherhood wants them dead. So them wanting someone who survived Vanini's factory is a wise way to reintroduce their characters. If you do decide to team up with them, they will aid you in combat even if it is quite minimal. The enemies seem to mainly focus on you and they don't act as a summon to take aggro. Their damage is quite low and they don't follow you for too long. It's nothing more than a minor mix-up. This whole level leading up to the Black Rabbit Brotherhood is quite linear. Luckily the linearity works in the game's favor here. This fight is going to be part of the game's peak difficulty, so preparing players with every single resource possible such as rings, souls, and throwables is going to be welcome. 
I often wonder if part of the reasoning behind the linearity of this game is because the bosses are back-to-back -back mechanically impressive, so they put their main dev time into combat and fights, while the level linearity makes it so you have to willfully ignore the game to feel underleveled. Right before you link yourself back to the Stargazer, you will come across one of the Black Rabbit Brotherhood members. Now that we've gotten this far, I have to say that the devs did a really good job at giving them character with very few bits of dialogue. Leading up to them was very noticeable that they wanted them to be a highlight. And they were. Their boss cutscene is even more memorable when they bring out the coffin that is meant for P. Their outfits are all distinct, and one of them even has a bucket head that Jiwon Choi, the game's director, would wear. The only lead up that is just as satisfying as these guys would be the rematch with Kenichiro and Sekiro. I think you know my thoughts on this level by now. It was a nice mix up having two NPCs fight alongside you, but it's nothing special that sticks out in my mind. Before we sink our teeth deeply into this fight, something to note is that essentially all Liza P bosses focus on being mechanically interesting. There isn't a single spectacle boss and this game only has one gimmick fight. And you'll know why I am talking about this now once we start talking deeply about this fight. But if you are a new player to the series, these bosses may halt your progression quite drastically. I can understand the two sides to this coin. I am on the side that loves the fact that all bosses in this game try to be mechanically interesting. I like learning and understanding enemy movesets, I also like losing and dying repeatedly. It's a feature that I can handle with ease, but new players may see this game as nothing more than artificial difficulty because they're still refining their skills and every boss will be a brick wall that may take hours to climb over. It's especially a touchy subject because not everyone likes to summon. Summoning is not a stat adjustment. It subjectively makes the game less interesting since bosses will take their attention off of you and onto the other AI. There are definitely players that are in the unfun camp of, I hate summoning but my skills aren't the best and I will struggle at a boss for hours on end. This is something that From Software does quite well. In From Software's games, they usually have a gimmick boss or a spectacle boss to elevate the feeling of despair if you've been struggling. The reason I am mentioning all of this now is because the Black Rabbit Brotherhood is hard. They're very, very hard. Even for someone like me who has 9 years of experience under my belt, I still died to them for a good half an hour before my kill. This is probably the hardest fight in the game and most of the boss fights in this game going forward are also very hard. Maybe the devs have grasped the fact that they have good mechanical fights but have zero spectacle fights and they are preparing one for the DLC. This fight will test everything that you have learned to a near max potential. Perfect parries, dodging, and camera management all in one. I played Liza P three times for this video, and two out of the three times, the eldest sword broke from me parrying him so much. Fighting the big brother rabbit one versus one is quite manageable. He would be a really good mini boss as a solo experience. But when the other members jump in to aid him, there are a few things to note. Since this fight is you juggling multiple AIs at once and you have no poise, great swords feel astronomically worse here. They feel almost as bad as a solo great sword user versus millennia. The enemy AI's aggression is most likely tuned down similar to from software duo fights, but they are also like Orn and Smo and all these members are melee, so you will have to be doing some running around in order to find a proper opening. One last note is about the weapon repair tool and the healing charge. I have yet to talk about these two mechanics since they are going to be prominent in this fight especially. This fight is one long endurance test and you will need to repair your weapon in this fight. Repairing in most bosses is usually another skill that you have to latch onto. I like to think of it like Ishin's Shura ending in Sekiro. If you heal in the middle of the boss arena during that fight, he will dash up to you for a punish. Liza P's AI isn't that punishing, but repairing your weapon does add tense moments within gameplay. You don't just say, hey, I need to repair my weapon here and start the repair cycle. You need to be aware of the boss AI and your positioning. In general, I don't hear too many people talking about this mechanic, and while I am rather neutral about it, I lean more on the positive side of this neutral scale. The healing charge is also noteworthy for this fight since you will most likely need all of the healing charges for this fight. The healing recharge can lead to fun and exciting moments, and while I like the weapon sharpen mechanic more, I think they're both welcome changes. Gank bosses are not a new idea to the series, but the Black Rabbit Brotherhood can quite literally be considered a gank squad. If you focus all of your attention on the eldest, the other siblings will jump into the arena and you have more than two enemies to fight at the same time. FromSoft has only done this real gank idea once from my memory, and that was in Dark Souls 2's DLC. The rematch of this fight is you juggling the other siblings simultaneously, so I'll save the conversation for that fight. What I can say is that this isn't the worst duo fight in the game. In fact, I probably like this fight more than the average Liza P player. 
but if you compare this gang fight versus someone like Ornn and Smo, they feel more fleshed out than all of the Brotherhood. Ornn and Smo feel like menacing fights by themselves, and Dark Souls 2 can prove that since you literally fight Ornstein solo in that game. The Black Rabbit Brotherhood members feel like good mini-bosses, not boss quality level when you judge them individually. So when I look at this fight, I simply see a group of well-done mini-bosses. The most comparable fight I can think of is the three Mantis Lords in Hollow Knight. Fighting the three of these Mantis Lords is a tense work of art. It feels like the game is running at full speed when this happens. But fighting the Black Rabbit Brotherhood feels like a weird recipe that didn't mesh as well as it could have. I know I came off as pretty negative at the end, but I will ultimately say that I like this boss, don't love it. After defeating the Black Rabbit Brotherhood, you have to fill a few gaps before you can go to Rosa Isabella Street. The most interesting one is the painting that the Black Rabbit Brotherhood stole. This painting is of Carlo, Geppetto's son. Before I get to my main point with this painting, I have to say that this game winks at you in so many creative ways with this painting. Not only does lying have some consequence since this painting will give you the golden lie, but it's really fun going back and looking at this painting's nose grow. Now, I have not spoken much about the story with Liza P, and I plan to keep this video more oriented towards the gameplay side of things, but I will break this rule when P's hair grows since that's right around the corner. Since this area has too many bosses, I figured I would talk about how much I respect the Carlo idea they put into this game. Carlo Collodi was the original author of The Adventures of Pinocchio that was written back in 1883. I actually plan to read this book when I am done with this video, but I massively respect how the devs threw him in as a homage to the game itself. In case any of you are curious about how this game came to life, the Pinocchio IP has been in the public domain for some time now. Disney does not own the IP, but they most likely do own the original characters to their version of Pinocchio. And I'm definitely outside of my knowledge and the game itself by this point, but I thought I would mention it here since we have some downtime. Now that we are back to the game, Rosa Isabella Street is a far more interesting level than what we just had. We're back to a city landscape and the atmosphere is more enjoyable. It may look like the level starts out relatively slow since we are fighting the same puppets we found at the very beginning of the game, but we just got done with carcass zombies, so seeing these puppets return is a nice way to smoothly transition back to puppets. Once you get past this small area, we will be introduced to a multitude of new enemies. Once this game rewires your brain back to puppet mode, the game noticeably becomes a lot more interesting. This area introduces a variety of new enemies in aesthetic and moveset. The previous puppets that we fought were all slow and telegraphed attacks. These new enemies will most likely throw you off guard with how jarring they are compared to the previous puppets that we have been fighting. You are fighting a mixture of exploding enemies, maids, and baby puppets. You will also hear Adelina's song in the background, adding an ambient flair to this level. Even though this level goes against my desire for a large and expansive zone, I can't deny it's a definite win in every other department. Despite her elegant appearance, the White Lady further signifies Liza P's terrible NPC fights. Her lead-up music and arena presentation simply does not match the quality of the fight itself. It's a shame that everything surrounding her is some of the game's peak work, only to be tarnished with a terrible fight. There are multiple issues with her. Luckily, the footage I captured was a pretty good example of how easy it is to backstab her with minimal effort, and how she only has a few moves and the most notable ones are the thrust and a parry move. Luckily, her weapon breaks relatively easy and you can acquire her stylish outfit later in the game. I don't think Liza P's community is over the moon about these NPC fights, but I think I have more of a dislike for them than the average player. Even Gideon in Elden Ring doesn't do it for me. On the bright side, the next mini boss is good, so we can look forward to that. The next section of this level is going to consist of crawling through pipes. This offers better visual variety than what the game has been doing in previous sections. We're no longer in a city or forest aesthetic. The pipes are completely new which makes them inherently more interesting to me. There's even expanded level design here since going down this optional route will bring us to a mini boss and links us back to our current stargazer. This is all great to me, it's nothing spectacular but it's a step up from what we've previously had. I'm not sure if this level had more development time since there are only mini bosses here, but it's a welcome change nonetheless. The level continues enforcing the earlier enemies that weren't introduced with more of them to fight to ramp up the challenge. It works really well and this is all a success in my eyes. The devs really outdid themselves in this upcoming fight and this may be my favorite mini boss in the entire genre. The Mad Clown puppet feels like a troll in all the best ways, not entirely because of his aesthetic, but if you try and fight this boss head on, he's going to feel too hard and it may even feel like it's artificial difficulty. My first time experiencing this fight was me dying and being frustrated that I had to run all the way back to his location. 
On my run back, I started thinking, there's no way the next Stargazer isn't right around the corner. And what do you know, I was right. If you fight this enemy in a 1v1 encounter, you'll see his true colors. This boss is a testament to the game's art and animation design. His true form is only used once, and he's done better than the Sekiro version of this boss. His whole moveset makes me laugh. His stagger state of him cowering is a wonderful touch. His gluttonous body enhances his belly slam. Everything about him is near flawless, and I mentioned he's better than the Sekiro boss. Both of these enemies on your screen have long combos that test your ability to properly reflect. Sekiro's enemy only does this arm slash for the most part, and it does get repetitive after you've seen it once. The Mad Clown puppet is somewhat of a teacher. Romeo, the upcoming boss, has a long string of attacks you need to deflect, and this boss plants the seed of constant deflects. I like this boss a lot. I also hear a lot of slander about him, and I never understood why. This mini boss alone is better than some of the real bosses in this game, and I think it's a testament to how well designed the mini bosses really are. I won't be going over every single mini boss, but if you are at this section and have not played Lies of P, the mini bosses are well worth your time. Most of them offer unique movesets that are fun to fight. While the Opera House may look grand in scale, it's a rather short and sweet level. I mentioned that the Cathedral Library was astonishing from the outside, but lackluster on the inside. Luckily, the Opera House doesn't fit this narrative. It's probably my favorite level in terms of aesthetic and atmosphere. It takes us away from the other sites we have been seeing earlier, and it makes sense artistically for this level to be as pretty as it is. At the very start of this level, you will quickly come to grips with the disruption mechanic that is prominent in the Opera House. This is ripped straight from the Souls games, and in Dark Souls 3 it's called Cursed. I am usually against these types of mechanics, but I guess they've grown on me as the years have passed. The two active enemies in the start of this level will synergize and work together in ways that I can't recall from software ever doing. When the puppet dolls are within a certain distance of the spider ladies, they will actually become empowered. Their attacks are infused with disruption. They have more HP, and they will have more active poise when you attack them. This is the only time Lies of P does this, and I feel like they accidentally struck a new chord and didn't use it again. It makes these enemies feel more unique, but I think this idea can be morphed into a really elaborate boss that the series has not seen before. Once you defeat another horde of the dolls, you will come across another great mini-boss. Now that you've seen close to half this level, I think the devs had a clear vision of how they wanted this level to stick with players. The enemies look great, the level is more interesting than what we've seen, and the boss we are going to fight here is one of the most important story bosses in the game. Right before you enter the boss room, you can fall down the platform and reveal an optional side area that will link back to the stargazer of this level. The link back is not a shortcut to the boss, it's rather the game telling you that you've done everything in this level and it's time to fight Romeo. Putting this here is well thought out in my opinion, but one interesting thing with Lies of P is its unique relationship with boss runbacks. I have not timed any of the runbacks, but during one of my runbacks I actually fell off the ledge that links you to his boss arena. This got me thinking that Lies of P does a really good job at streamlining most obtuse aspects within From's games. The storytelling is easy to understand, NPC quests are highlighted when you can progress them, your souls spawn outside of the boss arena in case you die with them, but boss runbacks are in this weird limbo that doesn't make sense to me. None of them are offensive, but I wonder why they didn't cut them entirely. This game's boss runbacks sit in between offensive and non-existent, but they still have no purpose besides making players annoyed and extending time. The whole boss runback conversation has been in the FromSoft community for ages, and I am entirely against them. Running back to Dragonlord plus Sudasax in Elden Ring is nothing but a monotonous chore, and while it doesn't ruin my experience of Elden Ring, it definitely irritates me to my very core. We can now check this level off the to-do list, and as I mentioned, it was short and sweet. It's one of my favorite levels in this game, but I can still list off a variety of improvements that I would like to see. With how varied the atmosphere and enemies are here, I think they could have developed this to be twice as long and complex, which would make it be much more memorable. The cutscene and storytelling leading up to the King of Puppets is something that I shouldn't ignore with this video. The King of Puppets is what the game has been leading up to for some time now, and it's even more important when Romeo comes into play. Romeo and Carlo were close friends prior to their deaths, and from my knowledge, Romeo's ergo actively does not want to kill human life. 
I figured that Romeo was important enough to warrant a short bit about the story since the game actively acknowledges the King of Puppets and gave more context about Romeo. I have this wild belief that the King of Puppets and Romeo is almost as good as some of From Software's peak boss design. I think this boss is tied as the best boss in the game, he has minimal flaws and has many great moments. It's very close to being up there with the series greatest hits and some people may even put this fight in that category. I don't want to suggest that this boss is perfect and I also want to state that I am far more lenient to camera issues in these games than most. But since the stature of the first phase is so large and Liza P is a melee only game, he will be doing long windup attacks that are hard to see and can frustrate certain players. He doesn't reach the grade of offensive, but large enemies like this can be an immediate turnoff for certain people. This issue gets alleviated in the second phase since he will start fighting by dragging his arms on the ground. And in case you didn't know about the second phase, this fight even breaks the trend that Liza P has and is actually a three phase fight. I did not notice this until I was practicing this fight for the video, but when you get half of his health bar down, he will flail his arms and start screaming. This is the tell that he has transitioned to phase two. Think of a transition like Gale going from phase two to phase three. It's subtle, and you can be so immersed within the fight and not notice it. The second health bar of this fight is superior, but there is still a lot of enjoyment to be had before the real fight begins. Now that we're dealing with Romeo, I have to say that I think he is the flashiest boss fight in the game. Unless you clicked with parrying more than most players, his fight is a reminder that dodging is an equally viable option instead of solely relying on parrying. His animations and attacks have long strings of combos and Liza P's perfect parry window is quite tight. So unless you have memorized a few of his moves perfectly, your best option is most likely going to be relying on dodging with a mixture of parries. He's definitely the fight I dodge the most and he further signifies this with his foot stomp attack. Dodging that move is extremely easy and leads to free damage. Romeo also signifies that Liza P has almost zero hitbox issues. I was looking back at my footage and my jaw was on the floor with how I didn't notice any issues with hitboxes. If Romeo was designed with the exception that players would be dodging and parrying at the same time, then that was a definite success, but the game could have capitalized on that idea more. Some attacks in this game are so telegraphed that not parrying them is definitely a waste, but most fights don't really do this until later on with the King of Puppets. If the game's sequel does bring back the same combat system with minor adjustments, then I would like to see more of these fights where I find myself using every mechanic the game has. Without a doubt, the King of Puppets fight was the best boss that this game has thrown at us. The only regret I have is not being able to talk more about him. The only potential issue is the camera, and camera issues in these games rarely get to me. I think this fight goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with From Software's A-tier fights. This team really does hold a candle next to FromSoft in this department. Our next boss is just as good, but I can understand if someone were to say this was the peak of the game for them. With Romeo defeated, our destination is to leave the Opera House and talk to Geppetto. He suggests that we need to go to the Grand Expedition to meet the Alchemists. In order for us to do that, we need to fight our way through an arcade to reach our destination. But with the King of Puppets dead, there's a noticeable change in puppet behavior. When you walk up to them, they are more sedentary. It's common to find them sitting down or moping since they seemingly lack vision. By all means, this is a bridge to funnel us to our next section, but it's one of the better ones in this game. It's telling part of the game's story without an interruption through a cutscene. Lies of P has many minor nuances like this that make the game feel more alive, or even immersed within itself. It's something that I appreciate the longer time goes on. Every game requires you to turn your brain off at times so that the game can work as a whole, but Lies of P and Sekiro do a good job at having gameplay and a story flow while not having an over-reliance of cutscenes. There are a few more of these quirks I want to mention later in the video, but I really enjoy seeing these when they appear. The Lorenzini Arcade is one of the longest levels that relies solely on fighting. You will be going through a large chunk of enemies before you link yourself back to the Stargazer of this level. Not only does this level have a lot of enemies and a large gap of fighting before you link yourself back, but there are also multiple environmental hazards for you to deal with. You will be going through a large chunk of enemies before you link yourself back to the Stargazer of this level. I mention all this because I did a test on my second playthrough with this level specifically. I did this entire level without resting at the Stargazer to test how the healing charge refill could work with level design. Liza P does a pretty good job at supplying you with a lot of healing charges, but also doesn't throw too many enemies at you before you go back to the Stargazer. We all know the thrill of getting that extra pulled cell mid-boss fight that leads to an exciting comeback, but I don't think the levels are challenging enough to recreate that feeling in levels. 
What I can say is that doing this experience heightened my appreciation for the system, and I hope it doesn't get put on the chopping block in the sequel. I ran out of charges when I was roughly 75% done at the level, and I was playing smarter and more thoroughly. I would even do extra hits to enemies to try and squeeze as much charge as possible. It's something that I hope the DLC experiments with, having a harder and longer level that will make most players uncomfortable around the midpoint since their healing charges are low. At most, they will have one spare charge when it actually refills. I think that even if the level design doesn't step up drastically, it can be further enhanced with NeoWiz's current strength of great combat and enemy design, while giving players a really hard challenge that's not boss battles. Near the end of the level, the game plays with the idea of having carcasses versus puppets. You will fight a brand new enemy puppet, and enemy carcasses will escape from a cage. I always enjoyed seeing enemies duke it out in Sekiro, so seeing this was an easy laugh for me. This level feels the most like a time stretch in the entire game. Once you beat Romeo, Geppetto motions you to finally go to the Grand Expedition, so you can meet the Alchemists and didn't even mention Lorenzi Arcade, it was simply in the way. I think this level is well liked within the community, but it's one of the more forgettable ones for me. I mainly appreciate how the game allowed me to fight for a long time without a stargazer checkpoint. Once you're done with everything in this level, you are contacted to leave by Vanini, and you are now making progress towards the Grand Expedition. I think the devs didn't want to have too long of a stretch of only puppets, so they kind of shoehorned the arcade in to force a mix-up to carcasses. The level after the Grand Expedition is puppets, so that makes sense in my mind. Luckily, the lead-up to the Grand Expedition proves that this team has real art talent in making upcoming levels look vast and interesting. Looking at this place from the outside is a beautiful shot, and the game supplements that site with another new mini-boss. Further cementing that an unsung praise this game deserves is its excellent mini-boss quality. Once this mini-boss is dead, we can ride the lift to the Grand Expedition. Our upcoming boss is one of my personal favorites. Before we go too in depth about our upcoming level, the story has changed drastically now that our hair has grown. I'm not exactly sure if your hair has the opportunity to grow after the King of Puppets or after the arcade, but in terms of the story, it makes sense that it would be after the King of Puppets. I have tried to keep this video more gameplay oriented, and I have a simple reason as to why. I simply don't trust my abilities to heavily focus on story beats in this game. I'm not a writer, I simply enjoy fiction. I do try to mention how the story is told through gameplay just like the puppets that are depressed in our last section, because that relates to gameplay, at least it does in my mind. Since we are in this section of the video, I want to point out a few more moments this game uses to tell its story outside of cutscenes. There is a cat you can interact with, and at the start of the game, it hisses at you because you are a puppet. Once your hair has grown and you start to become more human, the cat will let you hold her and is friendlier when P's hair has grown. P will also start to grunt during combat. He was silent prior to his transformation, and this is my personal favorite. I think this is asking too much, but I almost wish he was fully voice acted when your hair turns gray. I think that would have even worked better since the very final boss has voice lines of your friends to remind you why you are fighting. But this is why I don't talk too much about the characters, because that idea may be awful. I think that should pin the story section of this video, but I do want to note that I do like Liza P's story. It's just not something I want to fully shoehorn in, because I will have very little to say and the game does a good job at thoroughly explaining the plot to players. We are finally back to feeling like the game is progressing. The Grand Expedition brings us back to fighting puppets, and we no longer have the perk of a prettier color palette and a more soothing atmosphere. We also won't be getting that back, and the rest of the visuals have a more monotone and serious color palette. This can make Liza P feel a little bit samey on repeat playthroughs. I don't want to come off as overly negative because Liza P does have a proper mood that represents the game, but undeniably any flavor can use some spice from time to time. Thankfully, atmosphere is only one component to any game, and as usual, Liza P does a great job at adding new enemies to add that needed spice. The first half of this level is somewhat of a warm-up for the latter half that's far more entertaining. The first half has more of fighting enemies that you have seen and interacted with before. It also has the only troll encounter I can think of in the entire game. This level will progress with you on top of a walkway fighting the shield enemy that we saw back at Vanini's Puppet Factory. My first playthrough he knocked me off a couple of times, which led to a few very frustrating deaths. I can usually get away with a couple of joke encounters like this, but this one just seems overly harsh since you're on such a narrow path. I also have not talked about this game's easy mode. Summons and range builds in FromSoft's games are usually considered an easier option to take. The magic counterpart in this game is the shot put throwable item. These items melt mini boss HP, and I never used these items, but I figured I would mention it here since I find this encounter just so unfun. Once you lower the bridge, the Grand Expedition flaunts its purpose to the world. It's to exist 
exhibit puppet technology to the citizens of Krat. This works on multiple levels as the game will play with the idea of puppets that are idle and you never know if they will suddenly come to life. Everything on display is something that you've overcome, so the mental game of an enemy jump scaring you at random is something that got me pretty hard. If you care at all, you can also look at these finer details on enemy models. I looked pretty close at a few because I appreciate the art that went into them. Since this level is a puppet technology exhibition, I would have liked to see enemy models that were cut from the game. I looked at every idle model and all of them were enemies that we've seen before. The game very well can have models that just simply weren't cut, or models that they're saving for the DLC. I only mention this because the Lies of P community is still niche and I have not seen any members of the community dig through PC files to find this sort of thing. To sum this level up, this level is on the simpler side. There are new mini bosses, but I feel like we've talked extensively about mini bosses and by this point, mini bosses should be something the player shrugs at and doesn't find them that difficult. While the level and exploration side wasn't that interesting, I gladly cannot say the same about Victor. Champion Victor feels like an amalgamation of Godfrey Phase 2 from Elden Ring, Guardian Ape from Sekro, and Bane from the Batman comics. He's an extremely well done brawler boss. Having a brawler appearance and physique usually changes the tempo of these style of fights. It would not make sense to create an enemy with such a large stature and not check their mental fortitude. To cement this idea, Victor has long string attacks and is one of the most aggressive boss fights in the game. He does not let go of the trigger and will check you multiple times. If you have ever played against this boss, he will occasionally knock the wind out of you and the animation looks like he has sunlocked you. But his animations will pause for a second and you have the opportunity to dodge out and return to proper tempo. I'm not exactly sure if I explained that properly, so hopefully the gameplay should support that, but it's something you should definitely experience for yourself. I mentioned that Victor feels a little bit like Guardian Ape since he's a brawler, but these fights have a lot of differences outside of their fight style. Guardian Ape and Sekiro has the unique feature of being a beast type enemy, in ways that work well with Sekiro. He's not a kill that you will do by deflecting, he will probably be killed by vitality, not posture. That's where Victor differs the most from Guardian Ape. Victor definitely has the most telegraphed attacks in the game. I feel like I can properly defend reflect him the best out of every other boss that's not the Parade Master. This leads into the interesting conversation that Liza P has had. I've heard this argument split down the middle of being for or against it. There was some debate that the parry window was too tight in Liza P, but when I fight Victor, he felt so natural to parry. Some attacks are naturally harder to parry in this game, even if they're not long-winded combos. I wonder if the game doesn't properly convey certain attack animations and when you should time your parry. I can safely say that there are certain attacks in this game that I still wouldn't be able to parry, but if you put me on Sekiro, there isn't an attack on that game that feels obtuse or something that I wouldn't be able to deflect. I am by no means an animator, but I felt like I would mention that Victor is one of my favorite bosses and reflecting his attacks feels so satisfying to me. Nothing will ever top reflecting an Ichiro, but that's not the purpose of this fight. My only critique for this boss is that his health simply does not match his size. Since Liza P has extremely linear level design, as long as you're not running past the entire level, you should have a weapon that is aligned to the level's difficulty in bosses, but his HP simply feels like it drains away too quickly. His fight is made even easier by his intuitive attack animations that make him easier to parry than most other bosses. My desire for more of a challenge will be relieved when I eventually do a challenge run for this game, but fighting him doesn't match what his grand size would suggest. He goes down quite easily, his moveset is engaging, I love how he fights, but the fight ultimately ends before it fully starts. This somewhat reminds me of Lady Maria from Bloodborne. I wish she had more HP since she is a punching bag for the first half of her fight. I could probably convince myself that Victor is my favorite boss fight in this game, and like a few bosses in this game, holds a real candle next to FromSoft. Our next level is pretty good. Before we get too deep into the Barren Swamp, there is a quest I need to set up for that level. Once you defeat Champion Victor, Eugenie asks us to do her a simple favor. Alidoro actually saved her life, and since she is a kind spirit, she wants to return the favor with some handmade gloves. These gloves are unique because they are titled The Four Fingered Gloves. On my returning playthrough to Liza P, this went completely over my head, and I didn't even notice the gloves had a name that would suggest that they are unique. I had to do a repeat playthrough since on my returning playthrough, I lied, but telling her the truth is quite unique. I'm going to have to leave this quest on a bit of a cliffhanger until we meet Alidoro in the barren swamp itself.
I have a lot of positivity about the Barren Swamp. It feels like an evolution on so many levels with Lies of P. Lying feels like the better outcome for once, the game doesn't create a miniature area to bridge the transition of puppets to carcasses, and the Barren Swamp has the only optional level. It's not huge by any means, but it's there. I also see this level as a form of reflection. The Barren Swamp has a lot of rundown puppets that look defective, and some of them even have altered character models to suggest that. Most of the puppets here are returning enemies, and you can further reflect on how far you've come. These puppets are simply beneath you. Until the very end of this level, you've defeated every single puppet in this area. It also somewhat works with the story. Most players will have effectively gone through puberty by this point, and they will have long hair. The enemies here are at their worst, and if you've been interacting with the story in a more quote-unquote intended way, you will notice your character evolving and P is starting to become his best self. As I am writing this script, I talk more about the story than I ever intended because I truly believe that the story in this game is really well done. The Mad Clown Puppet even returns to this level and he is slightly altered for this fight. I wasn't able to find a new move that he does, but his spring punch is no longer a fury attack. The location he is placed from the developers was also very intense and further cements my thought process that he is a really well done troll fight. When you are running up the narrow walkway to fight him, he will very commonly do his wind up spring move to knock you back and make you lose progress. I find this to be a really fun way to asset stretch an already well made enemy. His kit is worth fighting two times and I got a good laugh at him being a troll. Once you've completed this section, we have a unique link back to our main stargazer for this level. You have to send down a minecart to destroy the path ahead for us. I try to comment on these kinds of link backs because it really does require more thought process and effort than having it be a simple door that we find that's locked. While it effectively achieves the same goal, I find it more entertaining and engaging. Right before the very end of this section, you can find an enemy that was only used one single time. He's a simple and regular buffed up puppet that we've killed a dozen times up to this point. He's a cool add-on, but I don't have that much to say about him. Now that we are engaging with Alidoro, you can eavesdrop and come to the conclusion that he is up to no good for the sake of Hotel Krat. He has one of the more unique interactions in the game when you talk to him about Eugenie's gloves. He's extremely rude and claims that he hates them. His character is alluding to the fact that he's not the knight in shining armor like he's been painted out to be. Although, that's not why I think this interaction is so interesting. Once you return to Eugenie to inform her that you gave him the gloves, you have the opportunity to lie or tell her the truth. I think most players tried to lie as much as possible on their first playthrough, and if you do tell her the truth, her reaction is more humble than I would have expected. She immediately suspects that something isn't right. She wants us to keep an eye on him and to keep our distance to make sure that we're safe. If you lie to her, then the expected happens. She's happy. This is the only interaction that I have found in Lies of P where telling the truth leads to a more interesting outcome. Eugenie may not have Vanini's raw intellect, but she is quite wise, and this decision adds depth to her character. I really hope she has a place in the DLC, as she is my favorite character in Hotel Krat. If it wasn't for Ali Doro's sacrifice back then, I don't want to think about it. And yet I can't forget it. That's why it's so puzzling. It's not like his finger could grow back. Could you find out more about the Alidoro for me? If I called it surveillance, would that be too cruel? In any case, we need to watch out. You be careful. Once we're at the Stargazer for this section of the level, the game opens up the physical space that we can splash around in. We're no longer in a tight, narrow walkway, and zones like this are a much welcome change from what we're used to seeing. The camera is also uniquely zoomed out since we are once again fighting puppets of the future. This part of the level going forward wants you to backtrack and come here. The weapon above is shooting missiles at you, so the likely intention that the developers had was to nudge at the player that juggling two puppets of the future, a poisonous swamp, and archery from above is too much to handle. So you should focus on fighting your way out of this zone, then come back. This is all most likely true. I am just stubborn, so I decided that juggling all this can be a fun challenge. And it was for the most part. I enjoyed it. The level definitely wants you to do this later, and this may even be why the Baron Swamp has the optional level, to remind you to come back and finish this zone. This area is important after all. You have a Doctor NPC fight and a supply box that you can take back to Hotel Krat. 
once you stubbornly defeat all of the enemies that we just spoke about, we are back to fighting carcasses. Another unique aspect with this level is that there is no bridge that this game usually does. Once the game decides it's time to fight carcasses, there is usually a small level section to rewire your brain back to carcass mode. This level does not do that. It uniquely has carcasses and puppets existing simultaneously in one level. This concept wasn't done much. It only happened in the arcade, and that was just with one single puppet, not a batch of them that we've been dealing with here. While this aspect of the level is unique, the zone does not offer much until the very end. Everything prior to the very end are things that we've seen before. More rolling balls and more of the same enemy types. I won't skip ahead quite yet, but something that I want to say is this level didn't introduce too many new enemies, and I would usually complain about that sort of thing, but I think the devs worked around that quite wisely. They made this level a puppet dump and altered the character models to fit the appearance of a wasteland for useless puppets. I've said this many times, but Liza P has an excellent batch of enemy variety, and this has me thinking about the Lords of the Fallen game. I spoke about this game on my channel, but whether you like this game or not, it's hard to deny that Lords of the Fallen has very few level enemies to interact with and that really hindered the level design of that game. I absolutely hated Lords of the Fallen, but I can't deny that the physical space was probably more interesting than Liza P's in terms of only judging solely by exploration. In my opinion, Liza P does not have the best level design, but at least it didn't ruin all the great things it does have, like Lords of the Fallen did. I know that some people really like that game, and they have every right to. I respect their opinion, but I entirely disagree. That game was miserable. I prepared this clip for a special reason, and this outfit that I'm currently wearing is a classic Pinocchio outfit. The puppet that I'm fighting here clearly resembles his original design. This was definitely a nod to the audience, and this was by no means a mistake. His face even looks like it was molded to be wooden. I really like how this game knows what it is, and it'll let go from time to time and not take itself too seriously. The Baron Swamp is coming to an end now, and I have yet to talk about the optional section, but I really enjoyed my time here. My first playthrough, I think I judged it too harshly because of the poisonous swamp, but I have to say this whole level has grown on me. There is only one potential flaw with this section, but it's more of a study than a flaw. The Baron Swamp is going to reuse an earlier boss with a twist. This level didn't introduce too many new enemies, and that's okay because it's not supposed to. All of this isn't really an issue, but the next stretch of the game is going to have a lot of reused content, and it makes me wonder if Neowiz was running low on either funds or time. Our next three bosses are reuses that have a little twist with their kit. I put this here because the Baron Swamp was the start of this trend. I personally don't mind reuse with these games. I've seen it many times before, but it's done in a long stretch similar to Mountaintop of the Giants in Elden Ring. And I will quickly mention the optional section of this level, and there's not much for me to say. There is no boss or unique enemies here. With that being said, it feels somewhat shoehorned in. There are some bits of lore that I find to be interesting here, but that's really about it. I hope the sequel gives us an optional area similar to Kanehurst Castle or Archdragon Peak. Reusing content in any game is more of a gray area than it should be. Elden Ring gets some flack for the amount of reuse it does, and there are a lot of mixed thoughts that goes into that conversation. Mountaintop of the Giants feels entirely unnecessary, and it is essentially all reused enemies up until the Fire Giant. But enemies like Tree Spirits are actually well hidden asylum demons from Dark Souls 1. Elden Ring's conversation goes both ways. There is a lot of reuse in that game, but FromSoft also attempted to hide it at times. Green Monster of the Swamp is in the unique middle ground of not being an entire reuse and not being something completely new. I would say that it's a step up from Lawrence in Bloodborne's DLC. It adds new attacks that were originally not in the scrapped Watchmen fight and has a new phase where you actually fight the Green Monster. I like this fight more than the original scrapped Watchmen, and I would consider this the superior version. Other bosses in From Software games that make a return later in the game are usually forgettable. I couldn't even tell you one move that Demon Fire Sage does that isn't in his original form. Lawrence's second phase feels awkward to fight, and the duo Guardian Ape and Sekiro is regarded as one of the worst fights in that game. If this was the new gold standard for reusing bosses, then I think the bar would be raised significantly. The only thing is, is that the bar does not keep the standard as the game progresses. 
It's why I don't have much to say about this fight, because we already covered this boss earlier in the video. Luckily, NeoWiz didn't have any leverage to bargain with players on how much they can get away with. They probably knew they were making a gem and didn't want a few bad reuses to get in the way when it came to player sentiment and review outlets. The next few bosses are going to push that limit though. It makes me wonder if this boss should have been positioned later because our next two bosses are going to be reused. We have a reuse of the Parade Master and Black Rabbit Brotherhood. That's also not including the reused first level that we're going to be talking about soon. But I think this boss should be the new gold standard regardless. Adding a new moves, a new phase, and it changes aesthetically. It's a really good reuse. Lies of P continues its soul's inspiration with a revamp of an earlier level. Revisiting an old level is going to have mixed player expectations that are going to be hard for the devs to meet. On one hand, most players are fine revisiting an earlier level to see how far they've come. The tutorial layouts are beyond them by this point, and they can reflect on how their skills have grown. On the other hand, there will be a subset of players that are easily turned off by this idea even if some change has been made. So, let's bring Sekiro back into the loop since it's relevant here. In Sekiro, at the very end of the game, FromSoft made an effort into putting new enemies and changing the atmosphere of the revamped level. Krat Central Station does make these revamps, but ultimately, it's a bit too samey for my tastes. The wound can get worse when you know what's coming. I did end up liking the Baron Swamp, but undeniably, it didn't introduce too many new enemies to fight. This level does introduce new enemies, but it's hard to notice since they are reincarnations of the puppets at the start of the game. They also die extremely quickly since they have no poise. When Sekiro took us back to Ashina Castle, the Red Guard enemies were far more engaging and stronger than Lies of P's updated enemies. My subjective view on the atmosphere is also leaning towards Sekiro since everything has gone to shit by that point in the game. I don't want to sound completely unfair to Lies of P because this level definitely was updated and changed. The first half still has a lot of familiarity to it, and the last half is completely new, even if that section of the level is one of my least favorite parts in this game. Once you fully grasp the fact that this level will be familiar, you can start to focus your attention less on finding out where to go, and more on the updated atmosphere that is taking over Krat. As the game has gone on, the petrification disease has gotten worse and coming back to the first level was a way of planting that idea in the player's brain. Sadly, I never found the petrification disease, the alchemists, or Simon Manus to be the highlight of the story. But when I go back to Ashina Castle in Sekiro, seeing the game's story advance in that way was more memorable than what this level offers in Lies of P. The last part of this level is another NPC fight that is the least interesting of all the mandatory NPC fights. And instead of telling you why I don't like them, I think these fights can have a place in Lies of P, but were ultimately poorly used. I do not foresee this team adding PvP into their future Souls-like games, so having more story-related fights like Gideon and Elden Ring could be a happy medium for all players. The White Lady shows this the best since her atmosphere and story were well done but her fight fell flat. The rest of what we have to talk about after the Weasel NPC is mostly new content on the bright side. Shortly after the Weasel, we will make our way back to the tutorial level, but the path that we took at the start of the game is blocked off. We will have to go right to progress. The Collapsing Street is without a doubt one of my least favorite zones to play in. You have disruption crystals that are only meant to slow you down and act as an auto kill. At least when they are incorporated into enemies, you have to be aware of their moveset and heighten your knowledge versus that enemy to avoid constant deaths. Luckily, the game supplies a decent amount of consumables to counteract these crystals. Once you get near the end of the section, you will find the Walker of Illusions mini-boss. This enemy was actually seen in the Grand Expedition, and they're simply buffing her numbers and adding a clone to the fight. She was good enough to reuse without it feeling too forced, but I ultimately don't have much to say about her. I have used the word reuse a lot in the past few sections, so it's probably worth talking about Lies of P's ending. We are in the latter sections of the game now, and the boss fights will feel a bit all over the place, ranging from awful to great. Our next level is going to drag on for some time, and it will feel samey by the midpoint. I said this in the last section, but I'm really starting to wonder if the dev team was running out of budget, so they put all their eggs into the strengths of the game, which is bosses and combat. This level definitely was not my favorite, but since Lies of P's combat is so spectacular, you can sometimes not realize the level itself wasn't matching the quality of the combat. 
I purposefully tried to be a little bit short on the reanimated version of the Scrapped Watchman because there was clear effort that was put into making his rematch more interesting. We were in a new fight arena, a mostly unique first phase, and they added more onto his moveset than I would have expected. The Corrupt Parade Master, on the other hand, follows none of these trends. He is the only boss that reminds me of Fuoko and I have essentially no memory of him once I kill his rematch. He does not add onto the game in any way. He doesn't do anything the game has attempted up to this point, and I wish they would have completely skipped this encounter. Right before we encountered this rematch, Sophia warned us that the hotel was under attack, and if you care about the story in this game, then you really just want to go back to the hotel and find out what's really going on. This rematch doesn't add any tension and just feels like a forced roadblock. It feels like the devs also could not find a unique gimmick to make him stand out, so they went with him spitting out an ad that doesn't change the fight in any meaningful way. Reusing early game enemies and bosses has been done so many times in this series. We have seen FromSoft stretch nearly every asset to the max in Elden Ring, and a game like Sekiro feels very pure, with the duo Guardian Ape being the only standout in my mind. Our next fight arguably makes more changes and it still isn't enough. As I said, this is just mostly forgettable. I will have some similar thoughts for our next fight, so be prepared for that. We can finally go back to the hotel, and we are almost out of this awkward stretch of reused content. Sophia warned us that the hotel was being attacked, and now we can see the full scale of that attack. The hotel is noticeably cluttered, but it's going to function as it did prior. Once you find the hotel members, you learn to no one's surprise that Aladora betrayed you, and the Black Rabbit Brotherhood was at the root of this attack. The NPCs that accompany us at the hotel are safe, but Geppetto is missing and our goal is to find him once again. Antonia then tells us that we can play a certain song on her piano, and it will unlock a secret passage that is our next destination. Before we talk about the relic of Trismegistus, I should let you know why this section is so short. Lies of P is labeled by chapters, and this is chapter 10 out of the game's 11. There is nothing new here. This is simply a story zone to set up a few developments with Gemini and Alidoro. We will have our rematch versus the Black Rabbit Brotherhood, and for the most part, that's it. If you ask me, Lies of P has 10 chapters because this can be completed in a mere 15 minutes. This area is shorter and less interesting than Bjorgenworth and Bloodborne to put that into perspective. I have peppered this idea since we got to the Barren Swamp, but once again, it seems like the budget and time restraints were really starting to show at the end of this game. The next level is better, but feels very samey, very quickly. With all of that being said, we're on to our final encounter with the Black Rabbit Brotherhood. The rematch with the gang squad is a letdown in almost every way possible. As usual, their presentation and individual models are interesting, but the fight itself is not. The fight is reversed here, and you are fighting all of them at once besides the eldest. This fight has a unique flow to any other fights in the series, including from softwares. It doesn't feel like a gank fight, but rather feels like you're fighting one member individually, while the others mostly just watch. They do barge in from time to time, but their AI is heavily toned down while one of them is completely active. To give this fight a compliment, most of the time when you do get hit by another member, it's not from your backside, which would be frustrating since you wouldn't be able to see them. I mentioned that this fight has a unique flow, so let me compare this fight to real duo fights. Fights like Sister Frida or the Demon Bats from Dark Souls 3 are designed with their movesets to work together. They go hand in hand. When fights are well designed like that, you can reliably unlock your camera to get a better view of the enemies you are dealing with. It's part of the magic with duo fights. You have to have excellent camera positioning. But since there are three enemies on your screen at once, keeping them all in view simply would not be possible. Which leads this fight to be even less enjoyable than the first time. There is the rare occasion when two or more of them are being aggro simultaneously, which will bring you into the trap of running in circles just to find an opening like Ornn and Smo. Once you kill two out of the three members, the eldest comes back once again. If you broke his weapon in the first fight like I did, it will not stay permanent. It must have gotten repaired. Gank fights are probably some of the hardest fights to pull off since you have to design multiple enemies and have to work around the limits of the camera since only playing in locked cam usually isn't your best option. Their first encounter is better in every way because the eldest seems like he had the most amount of time and effort put into him and you are mainly dealing with him for that duration of the fight. NeoWiz and Round 8 decided to make two gank fights that don't hit the highs of a 2011 fight with Ornn and Smo. I wish they would have altered their design philosophy and made this fight one great fight instead of two mostly forgettable fights. 
the back-to-back -back reuse of assets started at the Baron Swamp, and having three in a row may be pushing the limit. I mentioned that the green monster of the swamp may have been better placed as the last of this lineup, so we can end on a high note because the fight simply does not leave players fulfilled. It only makes things worse because our next boss is the door guardian, which is one of the worst bosses in the game. Before we leave to chapter 11, I have spoken extensively about Alidoro and Eugenie's relationship, and this is where it's going to conclude. The Alidoro that you've been interacting with is not the real Alidoro. The real Alidoro was killed and you are interacting with Midoro. If you do decide to kill Alidoro, he will drop a vessel and you can take that to Vanini to decipher. It reveals in this note that the real Alidoro was related to Eugenie. Their stories were connected very well, and it ends as my second favorite story only behind P's story of becoming a real human. I've played through Liza P four times now, and the game never once hinted at this, but near the end of the game when your hair is grown, I wish lying would become the bad option or the unintended option by the developers signifying that P fully understands real human emotions and lying to make someone feel better is not always the right thing to do, even if it hurts someone. P also interacts with a broken down puppet, teaching him emotions that he has learned along the way. So I think it would have been real interesting character development. I really, really wish this was the case. Now that that's out of the way, we are officially done with chapter 10, and I think my thoughts on this chapter are quite clear. Our last chapter is the grand finale of this game. We are finally at the last chapter of Lies of P. The ending to any game is important, but I find endings with these games stick out in my mind more than they should. FromSoft always has rocky endings to say the least. Elden Ring's late game isn't that great, but Sekiro ends on the highest note that I have seen nearly any game accomplish. Lies of P doesn't stick the landing like I was hoping it would. It's not completely terrible, but it's also somewhat flawed. This level is the longest in the game, and it ultimately becomes very samey halfway through. I do not want to suggest that this level is all bad, but there's certainly more that I dislike than I ended up liking. If you found it odd that Sophia wasn't at the hotel during the attack, that's because we find her here, and she tells us that she was never at the hotel and it was simply a projection of her. We will meet the real her later on. Once you listen to the ergo wisps of past events, the level Stargazer is now active and we can progress forward. A compliment I don't hear many people talk about with this level is the atmosphere. In terms of its color scale, it ranks quite low, but at the early stages you will see wisps of ergo in the air. Simon Manus has been effectively treating Ergo like steroids and the Ergo is being injected into him. If these Ergo wisps catch your attention, you will also look at the grand scale of this level. You're at the very bottom and your mind can fill with wonder as you visualize what's waiting for you the higher you climb. This level starts off quite strong. You have a clear goal in mind and Liza P breaks a streak it hasn't done since the Barren Swamp. We have a wide open area to take advantage of since the beginning area is quite hard. You are being pelted by weapons above you and there are two scorpions for you to deal with. Since there is more wide open space for us to deal with, the game can take better advantage of its enemy variety and force harder encounters. The game has relied too much on narrow paths up to this point, and even though it doesn't last long since this section is quite small, it was a welcome change nonetheless. The introduction to this level starts off strong, and it will start to show its true colors with our next boss, who just so happens to be one of the worst bosses in the entire game. Never in my life have I complimented Elden Ring's Fire Giant until now. The Door Guardian is probably Liza P's worst boss and it gets completely outclassed by the Fire Giant in Elden Ring. These two have a few similarities that are immediately obvious. Their body does not fit on the screen, you are supposed to attack the leg, and they have slow telegraphed attacks but will hit very hard in return. Door Guardian continues the trend of uninteresting bosses and we've had three in a row now. Poor bosses are given in these types of games, but it becomes more obvious when they are back-to-back -back disappointments. I'm not exactly sure what the devs were trying to accomplish with this boss. I have more questions than answers with him. The most frustrating thing about this boss is something that I have noticed in Lies of P. I do not know if this is a glitch, but if you look at my stamina regen, it's far, far slower than what it usually is. I also noticed this with Puppets of the Future as well. If the developers intentionally slow down your stamina regen because of how telegraphed extremely large enemies moves have to be, then I simply do not agree with that game design. I should also note that I have a ring that improves my stamina regen just to make matters more clear for you. I'm not exactly sure what is added to the game with fights like Fire Giant and Door Guardian. They are not mechanically interesting and they lead to frustration more than anything else. 
This level is long enough, so adding this boss to extend game time really wouldn't accomplish much in the first place. I can at least get behind Fire Giant's artistic design and mid-phase cutscene, but Door Guardian offers none of that. He's the least inspired boss in the entire game. I said in the rematch with the Parade Master that I wish it was completely cut because it adds nothing. I feel the exact same way with the Door Guardian in every way. If the only reason they made this boss was to give the player the Alchemist Badge to open doors in this level, then I would say that was a poor reason to implement a half-baked boss. Sophia could have handed it to us, or it could have been at the very top of the stairs we climbed to get here. Luckily, this is the last horrible Liza P boss, and the rest offer something that's memorable. Once we have the Alchemist Badge, we can continue forward. I should note that the Alchemist Badge simply allows us to open certain sections of the level. It does not do anything beyond that. Since it has a very one-dimensional use for allowing certain structures to open, I don't really see the point to it. Most Liza P levels are quite linear, so making us use this weird gimmick that doesn't really change or add anything new is something that leaves me scratching my head. You will also notice that the Ergo Wisps that I mentioned earlier are no longer in our view. This removes the atmosphere of this level, which leaves us with a near colorless and bland path to fight through. There is very little artistic variety here, and we are left with an overabundance of a few colors. And with this level having 10 total stargazers, the longer it goes on, the more tedious it gets. And since the finale section is known as one of the least enjoyable levels to be in, I figured I would talk a little bit more about Liza P's level design since I don't have much to say until we get to the bosses. I tried to limit my issues with this game's level design throughout the video because, like most things in this game, my viewpoint is entirely subjective. I have seen many people that simply do not care about the level and world design. The game's combat is a large part of the beauty, so getting more excuses to fight is always welcome. What I can say is, think of how much Dark Souls 1's level and world grew after FromSoft launched Demon Souls. We went from literal archstones that would teleport us to a section of the world to an interconnected hub that is still praised to this very day. It was definitely the better choice to choose combat as the focus for this game since that was able to lay the foundation and weaker aspects of this game can be expanded upon in the DLC and sequel. I mentioned this earlier in the video, but Lords of the Fallen doesn't have bad physical space to explore, but it gets ruined by everything else in that game being problematic. That game really had a lot of issues. I do believe that FromSoft has the best level design in the entire industry, so I don't expect every level to be as good as Stormvale Castle. What I do think needs to be expanded in the DLC and sequel is having more exploration in individual levels. This game isn't a literal straight shot, but if there is a side area, it's a quick, off-the-beaten-path trip and nothing more than that. Think of how FromSoft added the cliff in Stormvale Castle that you can fall off, or the sewers in Leyendel's level. They have these extremely large and complex levels that force you to build a map in your head to continue forward and find the variety of secrets that are hidden. I think that's all I should say, even though I have a lot more I want to say. I am a bit of a stickler when it comes to this sort of thing, but I really hope that the levels are expanded in the DLC since only late game players and most likely dedicated Souls players will be in that section of the game. But now that this section is over, let's talk positively, which this video desperately needs after three uninteresting bosses. I find that I am in the popular opinion with putting Loxasia as one of the best fights in Lies of P. She's in the number 3 spot for me, with Victor and Romeo being the only competition. It amazes me that Round 8 can make their first Souls-like and I can confidently say that she holds up with From Software's A-tier bosses. I would safely put her and Victor around the spot I would put the Nameless King. Those fights are simply that good. She also exemplifies the elated feeling you have because of the journey it took to get here. Luxasia manages to be a literal block this late into the game. Not only is she blocking the path forward to Simon Manus and Sophia, but you also have to block the temptation to take the fight into your own hands. At times, she will take control of the tempo and you have to play around her, not the other way around. In Phase 1, she has a multitude of attacks where she will rapidly swing her sword and you have to respect that. She will also do this at the very beginning of her second phase, but now you're reflecting lightning balls back at her. Luxasia rounds out Liza P's ending in ways that I'm not sure Neo was intended. Our next boss is by no means as good as her, and the Nameless Puppet is an optional boss, so players can get one last brute challenge if they decide to give their heart. Her two phases make her extremely well-rounded. Her first phase is aggressive, but she also has a lot of slow attacks that are easy to read. Her second phase, she drops the armor and her speed will pick up in return. 
her and Simon Manus will bring some spectacle to their fights, and this is something that the game didn't really have up until now. The fights prior were mostly mechanically interesting, but didn't have these eye-catching moves. Simon Manus has more spectacle to his fight, but this fight is overall better. She's a fight that I don't have any issues with and leaves me excited to see what this team cooks up for their future content. With our best girl dead, our final chance to evolve P's character is through Sophia. I don't have all that much to say in terms of Sophia, but I find it really impressive how a character with zero voice lines can have development like P has. I already mentioned why I didn't talk too much about the story in this video, and I know that this is one of the more important parts in the game, but I don't have much to say about it besides it's well done and I enjoy it. I also never clicked with Simon Manus either, and her character is connected to him. Right after our interaction with Sophia, we continue our climb to Simon Manus. The music in her room actually continues throughout the rest of the level, and Liza P never had this soothing, somber music like this throughout its levels. This music works really well for me, especially if you have gray hair. I feel like it adds more to P's character, as he now has more to fight for than what he was originally made for. He has grown to appreciate everything about life, and avenging his friend feels like one of his first goals. His previous goals were mainly tasks he was obligated to do, but that has finally changed. While this entire level did feel a bit tedious, its storytelling really shines for me personally. The rest of this level is fighting through enemy mobs, but most of that is beneath the player by this point. We will also eventually have our last interaction with Geppetto, but both of us want the same goal, to kill Simon Manus. Simon Manus is the closest, best fight in Lies of P, only to be painfully pulled away from that achievement. Besides his story in the game, he has a lot of unique things in his fight, which mainly revolve around Phase 2. Phase 1 is where the issues quickly arise. It feels like the developers wanted his gimmick to be delayed attack after delayed attack. He awkwardly shifts his body and weapon in ways that simply do not look natural. He's technically the final boss of the game since the Nameless Puppet is optional, and for a game with such a strong boss lineup, he ultimately doesn't grab everything that the game has done up to this point successfully. He's also the only boss where I had multiple camera gripes. With his attacks being delayed constantly, I don't know why the devs didn't want us to see his whole model. It would be less frustrating seeing how fast the whole model moves in order to comprehend his attack. The only reason I can think of as to why they made the camera so awkward here is because the animations themselves look awkward with how much delay there really is. The move where he jumps in the air presents this perfectly. It's like gravity and physics forget how to work and he will be in the air for an extended period of time but falls down almost instantly. The issue isn't this one single move, his whole kit feels this way. It's not an annoying move, it's annoying moves. His second phase follows these patterns but I have more to say in terms of positivity with phase 2. I have mentioned multiple times throughout this video that Liza P only has strong mechanical bosses. Simon Manus is the closest spectacle boss in this game while still being more on the mechanical side. Think of Radon and Elden Ring. His build-up and event is spectacular while still forcing you to focus on the fight. Simon Manus is by no means close to Radon in terms of spectacle, but has that aspect going for him. He calls down the literal hand of God to assist him in combat. He also has the vibrant blue color that lingers throughout the boss arena. A lot of really well made work went into that part of the fight, but I don't think it bandages that one gimmick pushed to the max. A final boss in a Souls-like will resemble a lot of different ideas to people. I remember Gwen from Dark Souls for his piano, original soundtrack, and I remember Ishin for being a near perfect fight, but I also remember the final fight in Demon Souls, and I ever so sadly remember the Elden Beast. Simon Manus sits somewhere in between of not being great and not being awful. I know that a few of you are screaming at your monitor about the Nameless Puppet, and trust me, we're going to get to that next. But he's optional at the end of the day. You can give your heart to Geppetto, and the game ends with Simon Manus. I mentioned that he was close to being one of the best bosses in this game at the beginning of his boss section, but with how one-dimensional his whole fight is, I would have to end up rating his fight with a very simple, meh, he's fine, but nothing more. If you didn't like me chipping at Simon Manus as hard as I did because Nameless Puppet was the true final boss, then I hope I will be able to alleviate that frustration. 
Lies of Peace Endgame has had so many uneven steps of not going forward, but also not going backwards. We have had a mixture of great fights and terrible fights. The Endgame leaves me with more of a sour taste in my mouth than a good taste. I mention all of this because the Nameless Puppet is the last chance the game has to leave a good impression in players' minds. And I don't have to tell you that the Nameless Puppet doesn't do that. The Nameless Puppet is a great fight. It has storytelling within the fight that's far more interesting than what Simon Manus accomplished, and the Nameless Puppet's moveset doesn't rely on one gimmick like we just saw. It's not the greatest final fight I've ever seen, but that's okay, and I mention all of this for one reason. I can sit here and evaluate the Nameless Puppet fight like we have done with every other fight. But I'd like to put a bow on Lies of Peace fights in general. I think they are the strongest part of the game tied with the weapons. The main thing with bosses that I want to hark on about is that in future games, I think the devs need to focus on smoothing out and making it less obvious which bosses did not get as much development time. Think of the Witches of Hemwick from Bloodborne. It's clear that FromSoft put minimal time into that boss since there is essentially nothing new there. If we compare the Nameless Puppet versus Fuoco, then I think this point should be clear. Fuoco doesn't have much going for him at all. In my three playthroughs for this game, I still cannot remember much of him besides the oil he shoots in Phase 2. I think this game's sequel should focus on the addition of spectacle bosses and smoothing out the fights that aren't supposed to be these grand mechanical fights. FromSoft has done this in a way that I don't think many players have realized. Most main Elden Ring bosses that are not that great have a few quirks that make them memorable. Fire Giant has the spectacle, Renala has the pretty boss arena, and I think you are now remembering a few bosses that follow this ideology. No game can be perfect at this, so I don't want to suggest Elden Ring doesn't have bosses that are completely filler such as Godskin Duo. Near the end game, Lies of P drops this trend and I can only assume for the reasons I mentioned earlier, lack of budget and time. To close out the boss section of this video, I think this team has real talent and their future projects will have more assets for them to use so they can smooth out bosses in the future projects. I'm going to let the end cutscene play out as I wrap up my thoughts on Lies of P. But firstly, I want to say a kind thank you to anyone who got this far. I came back to Lies of P because this game somewhat left a mark on my channel. I was brand new at making YouTube videos at the time. I was still learning and unsure about the whole process, and trust me, I'm still learning and I'm still very much unsure about a lot of things, but baby steps are better than no steps, I suppose. I made a few now unlisted Liza P videos because I simply was not happy with their quality. I was trying to be first place in the rat race since the game had a lot of eyes on it at launch. I came back to Liza P because I truly do love this game. I also think that Liza P proves that you don't have to fall too far from the roots of inspiration. Liza P truly feels like a FromSoft game while adding on a few things of its own to make it unique. While competing with FromSoft is a daunting task, this game is setting up a fairy tale Souls like universe to really set their own stage. If this team steps up their level design, then I really do think that I can enjoy their games as much as I enjoy FromSoft's. The DLC will show the real quality that can be achieved with NeoWiz and Round 8 Studio, so I will definitely make videos leading up to it. I also tend to stray away from doing this on my channel, but this video was a bit of a monster to make, so if you did enjoy, then interacting with the video through subscribing or liking does go a long way. I think it does at least. I really have no idea how YouTube's algorithm works, so. If you have yet to play Liza P or were turned off by it at launch because of the unfair difficulty, I think it's well worth your time. It frequently goes on sale now too. Anyway, thank you for getting this far into the video, and I hope you have a great day.